Wow. All right. Hey. Hi. Hi, Nubians. What's up, family? What's going on, y'all? Yeah. I so saw. I'm showing this to Dr. Carr uh, during uh, while we were. Uh, what were we? We were just chit chatting. Yeah. Wait, waiting to try to upload this. So. Yeah. You know, I'm on. I'm in the Twitter streets for now. Uh, but I'm in there differently anyway. Than, no than question. Me. You got a place to go. I mean, you, you come home and then go out there in the Twitter streets. It gives a whole different meaning, doesn't it? Shout out to Elon Musk. And what did Mike say? Mike Mike said he put it on layaway and he couldn't get it out. <laughs> Michael Harriet is a genius. Oh, my God. He, brilliant. I think yeah. there's a lot more to this, but I also feel like we're we're in these last days where, you know, right is wrong, wrong is right, things are upside down, and we're going to have that conversation. But um, this brother, there's a brother um, named Gary Miller. He's an artist. And, you know, he was posting all week. He had a shy day and he had, he did a Dawn Staley John okay. and he dropped, he dropped this in my DMs. And I was like, wow. Yep. That's exactly what I said. I said, I want this. Wow. So well, that's, he said, that's he, fantastic. He drew that. He drew it. Hand sketch, charcoal, pencil. Yeah, clearly, because by how you can see behind it, whatever background that is, I mean, that's his drawing. He just propped it up and took a picture of it, huh? Yep. yep. So I said, I want it. I want it. I want it. And he said, he's, he did it a few years ago. Um, and I said, I said, I want it. He said, okay. He was going to get I said, no, charge me how much. And whatever he got, I wasn't going to haggle with him. So set, set the precedent. Yeah, I'm going to get this sucker framed. At Michael's and 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 he gonna be looking at me every day, reminding me that there's so much more that we can do. So I just wanted to uh, shout out Gary Miller and share that since yesterday was uh, El Hajj Malik Shabazz's El, uh, Malik El Shabazz's birthday. In the nineteenth, he had a. Um, in fact, they were in um, in the cemetery in Ferncliff. Uh, uh, brother James Small, Bobby James Small, who was one of Malcolm's young lieutenants in the Organization of African American Unity and the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And of course, he, Peter Bailey, there's still some folks around who were Malcolm's lieutenants um, and they go every uh, 19th. And so but that that picture, man, that's from that's from late Malcolm around 64, 65. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the the eyes for me, the thought, oh, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, things are running through this brother's head and he just takes pictures of people and insists and draws. So it's not like he sat, of course, with them, um, but he captures something that, you know, I'm like, I feel this. I feel it. So I want to. No, that's that's that thought. In fact, that that famous photograph of him in the dashiki with his hand to his temple that we talked about a while back. Our, our sister and, and new ans recent ancestor, Alice Wyndham, took when she was living uh, my Angelou's roommate who just made transition out of St. Louis, she took that famous photograph and that picture there. Yeah. You, for that to come through his fingers onto the page, man, he felt what, what you felt and what I feel too. I think what all of us do looking at it, that's a feeling. It isn't just a representation of an image. He captured that feeling. Yeah. And, and that's what art, art is supposed to awaken in us the things that remind us who we are, right? And so that goes for visual art, that goes for acting art, you know, play, you know, those people who act, which you were a theater major. I was a theater major for one day. <laughs> but uh, a humanities and, and, and culture person worker your whole life. So oh. that's, <laughs> you, you look at the literature, that's adjacent. That's the same. <laughs> I mean. Um, and and rap, rap, music, 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 probably more than anything because of that drum and that guitar straight from Africa. It gets mm. into so I had a conversation this week with uh, Wise Intelligent. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. I know. Okay. I was like, OK, I'm, 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 I'm moving up in the world. You know, uh, I can some of these young people don't know who Wise Intelligent yeah. is. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Hip hop heads will. But uh, yeah, I'm okay. saying because that, that's when you when you say a thing that is irrefutable and it gets in your soul it it transforms and it goes through generations you know so yeah so. Trenton makes the world takes <laughs> they don't know about their poor righteous teachers <laughs> you young people boy yeah in fact i went i was by adam clayton powell on, on i'll talk about that later on tuesday and uh the, the uh the school is still there <laughs> clarence 13x or as he would be known in the nations of gods and earth Father Allah. So I mean, I don't know about that age of hip hop professor. I don't think so. Oh, you we, know, we, we do a, a thing on the five percenters. No probably uh, quietly though, only in Nubia, because y'all don't. Uh, the world don't need to know all of the secrets. Say less. Say less. No yeah. 
talking with him, huh? Y'all have a conversation. That nice conversation was it was interesting. You know, you watch people today. We were talking off mic a little bit today. Is Christopher Wallace, aka Biggie, Biggie Smalls, Notorious B.I.G. Today is his birthday, and um, you said a thing, and then I said a thing. You know <laughs> about that, and I I said, well, he's no Tupac. I said that. Mm. We're like, you gonna start something? I was like, you know, he, he didn't make it to twenty five. But Tupac sat in that soil with with elders and got poured I mean, into. You know. that he was differently grounded. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. I, and then battle right. because I I spent time with Biggie. And he was on his way. Trust oh, him. Wow. Yeah, he was on his way. I did one of the his first grounding. Years. I mean, his grounding was you know his mom. He was Jamaican, right? Jamaican, you know, Catholic school raised. You know, very very staunch. His mom had you know these very strong uh, feelings. Do you have a witness? I think not not Catholic. Jehovah's Witness, and um, you know, spent time with with Miss Wallace, Miss Valletta Wallace, and yes. uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, this young brilliant. Like, I, I'll tell you, he was very smart, hmm. but not grounded. You know, I was thinking about culture today because I was writing from, of course, a social structure, you know, framework with um, the all daily. Sure. So it was always, you know, not who, are, but inside it was always like, why do we talk about the things that you know? That destroy us, but you know, if that's all you have around you outside your mother, so you know, mm. in two worlds because he knew right from wrong, he knew what was, but you know, well, somebody and his fa- and her family because I mean, he would go to the Caribbean as a child from I mean, it's not like he didn't want no way, I mean, that probably would kept whatever grounding he had there, yeah, he wasn't totally rudderless and wayward and out there, but you know, we we got to give people space to mature and grow up and. You know, we've we've had this conversation before about young people, but you know, like Stevie Wonder, grounded in well, having those mentors, having somebody to you know have to answer to on a on a different level, not your mama, but having to answer to the culture differently. You know, which I feel like Tupac felt the responsibility, and he was probably you know working through that in his twenties, didn't make it to his thirties to to actually foment you know all of that. But you know, I mean, how we had met Malcolm at twenty five. You know, 24, 25, 22. You know, he wasn't quite there yet. Well, that wouldn't have been possible because he locked up in Massachusetts. That's all I'm saying. Like no question. No question. <laughs> and it's and his and his sister Ella tried her best. In fact, in fact, we just uh we we went past in Harlem, uh up in the 130s. Ella had a, a house there uh for a while, uh near John Henry Clark's house, actually on 137. And um environment means everything. You're absolutely right. If we had met Malcolm at 25, I don't think he'd been any less brilliant, and he wouldn't have been any less impressed. But where have you been? The streets are no place for that. And we make all kinds of excuses. Well, they're brilliant, and they're just describing their environment. Well, that's all that all of us do. So when are we going to take on the real question of environment? Just because just because somebody's brilliance is, uh, is uh, what, what's the phrase that is often used to describe Tupac, uh, the rose that grew from concrete, that's a very beautiful, poignant, very social structure oriented concept in some ways. And also governance. Yeah, the concrete is the social structure, but the rose grew out of that soil you're talking about. And that soil is very much governance. And Biggie had governance. You know, I think I think about it in terms of this whole, again, absurd ADOS conversation is saying, you know, we're going to exclude people from any liberation struggle that is local based on where they came from. And. That would mean, of course, that Christopher Wallace, well, your people are Jamaican, right? So, I mean, I was thinking about this sister. Have you ever interviewed her? This was in the post on Wednesday. Pinky Cole, I'm sure you've talked with her, have you? The slutty vegan? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is great. I mean, you know, her people are, well, not Barbados. Where is she from now? Um, oh, yeah, no, she's Jamaican. Yeah, I was going to say Jamaican. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we saw, I, I, you saw, I'm probably, you probably talked about it on the show. Do you have any thoughts about the fact that this, she just spoke at Clark Atlanta. You know, my man Dan Black is down there. And I heard, I was watching the commencement address, and she set each of those graduates up with, what is it, a, a, an LLC? I think it, she said, y'all business owners now. And I heard somebody in the back say, yes, yes. And I said, that sounds like Dan. So I text, I said, Dan, is that you screaming? He said, oh, you heard me? I said, yeah, I heard you all the way here in D.C. But, but, but what is that mindset? That's a... That's not a that's not a Jamaican mindset or a Barbados mindset. That's a, an African mindset applied to a concept. I mean, but it just blew my mind. <laughs> Malcolm's mom was from Gr- Grenada. That's right, Louise. Yeah. Louise I, then he 
Well, he's not. I mean, but let's let's put that to the side because the the argument there is strictly for reparations, or it should be. But unfortunately, people don't have the capacity to understand, you know, or or maybe they don't want to. Well, that's that going to help. Yeah, you're undermining the very mission by by allowing that to divide us. Let's let's have when the money comes in, I'll be the first in front of the line saying yes. Let's lineage, maybe, maybe, maybe. Because I feel that way about student loan debt. I didn't have, fortunately, my daddy uh, paid for school. I, I ain't do anything to make that happen. I didn't have any school student loan debt. But had I had to spend the last 10 years, 20 years of my life paying up that debt, and then Biden comes and wipes the debt out for the future people, I don't think I would be angry about somebody benefiting from something that I suffered through. Like, I don't want anyone to suffer through something I had to suffer through. But there's a faction of, of society is like, well, I suffered through it. You should suffer through it. But I feel like that's, that's white people mentality. Let's no, just, no. like if I suffer through something, I don't want you to suffer through it. That's right. Please get please get your reparations. Please get your 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 student loan forgiven. No one should have to do the the hard thing. If you know, just because I went through it, you should go through it. I I don't know if that's African thinking. No, I mean, I mean, it, it, it ideally it isn't. It's it's certainly non non ideal in terms of any human culture. And you know, the, re the only reason I, I brought that up in that context is that regardless of the local circumstances that we have to negotiate to enable ourselves to get power the thing we can never lose sight of is and we'll talk about that when we talk about malcolm in a few minutes is that without being connected to one another very deliberately very strategically and very consistently no local struggle will succeed this is the problem so if people say well lineage okay let's talk about lineage is this lineage argument connected to other lineage based arguments among african people other places and then that's when you get the blank stare because no one has thought of that because you you spent all your energy arguing with an entity that is never disconnected they always coordinate and then they make it look like they just having a conversation with you at a local level. But in fact, they are coordinating all along. Meanwhile, you don't cut yourself off from the only thing that has guaranteed any progress for you. And you think you can argue with people as an individual and go somewhere. You're going to lose. You're absolutely. In fact, and we'll talk about maybe a little bit what happened in Buffalo since the last time we were together. Imagine if all the African countries and all the countries in the Caribbean now said until this man is put to death. Or whatever the uh, agreed upon objective is, you will not do business in Nigeria. You will not ship a carton to Trinidad or Jamaica. CARICOM now has the official statement on the slaughter in Buffalo. Here's the uh, African Union with their, you know how quickly they would turn around and get uh, Tucker Carlson out to paint if Congo said there will be no more coltan shipped out of until you do something about our cuts and everybody's arguing hey, no, hey, you know, uh. well that would never happen well that's where you've opened your mouth as my mother would say and put your entire brain on display because what you don't understand who have not studied yet and we that's why we have this space one of the reasons we have it is that we understand that every time even the threat of that has emerged is when you've seen domestic progress for our people and that, a brown versus boy of education if African countries weren't taking their liberation. The United States realized they couldn't keep doing it because they're going to mess around a minute. They're going to say, hey, wait, what about my car? Hold on. Look, can we help some of these bourgeois middle class Negroes at least so we can go out and tell the world? Because the Russians and the Chinese are telling these Africans that they hate black people in America. So you can't trust them. And guess what? We kind of do. <laughs> so <laughs> people don't understand. Anyway, but Malcolm understood. And we're going to talk about that. And, and Vicky Cole, just to finish her, um, not finish her, she, uh, she sent her her mission was to help the community, right? Her, in her it's business. Really something. Yeah. You know, it wasn't about, I mean, yes, getting us to eat better, but let me tell you, uh, we probably will gain weight if you eat um <laughs> the slutty vegan every day. You eat slutty, slutty vegan, right? Yeah, it's amazing. But her thing was, I'm gonna empower the women here, I'm gonna send them to school. I'm gonna like it was always centering how can I be of service to the people here? And I believe that that has to be the hallmark of any business anybody starts. How do we serve our community? And our community is not just people born in, in you know with lineage connected, but it's all the people in the community because I don't know where people are from in my community, but I know they look like us and I know that they're going through the same condition and I know the cops don't stop to ask. So let's, you know, center us in everything and we will, we can, we can feed ourselves and feed one another. I just can do it. it. Yeah. We can do it. I mean, like you say, Jamaican father got locked up. Now he's in Jamaica. And then 
she grew up in Baltimore, came to an HBCU, a public HBCU. Well, no, Clark Atlanta is not public, but the A in the um, in the Atlanta University Center, Clark Atlanta University. Uh, and she said, and when she, you know, I mean, her story, you know, her story better than I do. Y'all, y'all have talked, but this is interesting that she's open. She's got. Um, Five locations in the in Georgia, four in Atlanta area, and one in the fifth in Athens. But here, here's the criteria to you to what you raised, Pro. Asking, she says she searches for areas that are food insecure, lacking in vegan options, and generally not attractive to developers. Quote: If it checks at least two of those boxes, then I put a location there. In quote, she says, with the goal of her customers supporting nearby businesses and increasing property value, the biggest hurdle has been finding staff who believe in her mission and who aren't in it just for the paycheck she says if you in it just for the paycheck then you can't work with us we want people who are <laughs> i mean that is that is a way of knowing that is very much i mean that is in the best of the africana traditions i mean that sounds like those Igbo market women in in, in west africa that sounds like uh, the, the market women of jamaica the, the sisters who run uh the institutions in the u.s south or wherever you find Black people, it, it sounds like those elders who were in the grocery store in Buffalo. In other words, this is very much a way of knowing. And guess what? We won't be defeated. We're going to kill your way of life, you open enemies of humanity. We're going to kill it. Kill it dead. And if anybody thinks that's a threat for physical violence, it isn't. It isn't. As Ozzie Davis said at the funeral of Malcolm X, did you ever know him to do a violent thing? So, you know, that violence that Tucker Carlson, little Tucker, little Tuck and his uh, wife and them trying to get his get their offspring a little uh, leg up and to get into Georgetown and all the things that you think you deserve to hook up for that little fear you have or those little footsteps, those footsteps behind you. <laughs> That's you, you punk. That ain't got nothing to do with us. As Malcolm said, we're we're, we're nonviolent with people who are nonviolent with us. But you're going to stop running up on black people with guns. You're going to stop that one way or the other, but it's going to stop. But what Ms. Cole is doing is clear. She said, you know, you got to have this vision with us. And that is a very old vision and it's a very successful vision. But anyway, come, come on back. Probably. I'm looking in the app and people got all kind of you know, questions were asked. Tell us what's on your mind, what you're reading, the top three news stories for the weekend. People talking about they still trying to get over Buffalo. Lori, you read in Lost Education of Horace Tate. That's Vanessa Walker's book. Incredible that she did on Horace Tate, the Georgia Teachers and Education Association. Jim Crow's Pink Slip, I see. This is excellent. This is uh, my friend uh, Leslie Fenwick, who was former dean of the um, School of Education at, at Howard, before that, at Atlanta University. She wrote a book on how all these black administrators and teachers lost their jobs after Brown versus Board of Education, integration, so to speak, uh, because all the white people wanted was the best black teachers they could cherry pick a few shout out to nick saban i know you scared punk guess what it's gonna get worse for you <laughs> anyway that's their idea of integration is we'll take those two fast negroes the two 4.0s and the rest y'all go to hell and so leslie just wrote a book on that called jim crow's pink slip and i see Lori says she's reading it in the heartbeat of indigenous africa as well a lot of people are, are the nubians are filling up this chat in terms of things they're reading here um i love it i mean can you imagine you know, um, that we're in the age of ignorance and we have created a community of people who every Monday night, thousands, more people come into office hours on a Monday night with mm. Dr. Ray Carr, mm. sit in community with words in a book. In a book. Then, I, I mean, I, I've never seen that. You know, and there are book clubs all over, the people that book. This is book club. <laughs> like you said. And we're reading, we're reading, we're reading more in it. And in, in reading, you open your mind and the, and those brain chakras and those soul chakras get open. And then the connections, it's like you plug into the wall and then it just creates more. And now you have a library and bookshelves and your children. I mean, it's just, it has turned into a, a, an absolute thing, Dr. Carr, that um, I All of us. imagined it. I imagined it. And I thought we could do it. Oh yeah, no, you you saw it before we did it, and now we're doing it. But but you know to see it actually happen and unfold in a way that is uh, just beautiful. I just want no, to yeah, no, thank it, everybody that's come. Uh, it really is. It really is. Um, you know, it's interesting. It made me dig out because Monday night, of course, we spent just a week in, in transition before we get 
to the what will start Monday and finish Memorial Day Monday. And then we get to the sister who is who you're wearing today, who you representing today, our sister Octavia Butler. And that is fire right there. What you get up. But uh we're gonna do a drop uh in honor of this woman for her birthday. I decided we're gonna do something really special and oh. fertilize her. So your is playing, you know, he sent me the the the, the quality John with the pockets on both sides. Yes. And you know, this is this is his handiwork, and and we're about to do something really funky. We're talking about Getting some glow in the dark ink for the words, you know. So oh, you know, oh, and, uh, lights up. Yeah, we playing around. I'm See, that's that's no that's no joke. In fact, uh, wow. I mean, Monday, you know, Baba Oz, Baba, uh, Baba Oz, Soj, the conversation, but then especially that conversation, Sister Shamar from LA was talking about global community, how we make connections, and our young sister in North Carolina, Janae who is an artist who has really helped us explore the question of craft with the work of the great Tony K. Bambara. And just to spend a week with her and that allowed us to, and we, we, for those, for, for everyone in Nubia, we uh, put the black women writers at work, the long interview with um, Claudia Tate that's in this book, actually um, black women writers at work we put that in because of course as we know in nubia we read and discussed uh one of her short stories and we also uh, discussed one of her essays on you know the purpose of the culture worker and you know anytime that you know i get to spend thinking with listening to tony k bombara is just time well spent but to do that with a thousand and a third people on a Monday night and to just have that open up as a point of conversation about the nature of craft resonate resonated with me for the rest of the week. And you know, like I said, most of my stuff is in storage, but some things I kind of keep around because they are perennials. You keep coming back to them. And one of them is the collected work of Tony K. Bombara, her various short stories, essays, uh, her work, even her work with Dollars of the Dust. I'm pointing over my shoulder because had the screenplay back there. And this is an excellent piece that was put together by uh, two sisters, uh, one an ancestor, uh, Cheryl Wall. And we talked about the other sister, Linda Holmes, on Monday night because Linda Holmes also, I don't know if I can put it back, she wrote a biography of Tony K. Bombara. But this is an essay collection called Savoring the Salt, The Legacy of Tony K. Bombara, which is actually very, uh, very much excellent. And one of, one of the people we talked about on Monday night as well that I said, you know, I need to check on her. It's been, it's been too long uh, since I talked to her, uh, one of my Jegnas here in D.C. He was on the faculty of Howard University for a number of years, the great um, um, the great Eleanor Trailer, And Eleanor Trailer, who Tony K. Bambara, it's so funny, Tony K., uh, she was asked, Claudia Tate asked her about, in this interview that everybody in Nubia has, we scanned it and put it in the database. When um, Tate asked her about critics, because Tony Cade, who was a novelist, essayist, screenwriter, did a lot of work in film. Uh, we passed the, the anniversary of the bombing of Osage Avenue, the MOVE organization. She did a film with her dear friend and comrade, Louis Messiah, who's also in this anthology, by the way, great filmmaker. Uh, she did W.E.B. Du Bois, worked, worked on that documentary. Um, also a Malcolm X documentary. And I said, we'll talk about Malcolm in a minute. This is just, you know, kind of some opening conversation we're having. But she said, uh, when Tate asked her about critics, because Tony K said the work of the critic is to help illuminate and help kind of help us understand what artists are doing. And Claudia Tate asked her, well, you know, who, who are some of the great critics? And she said, well, I don't want to, I'm kind of disappointed in the kind of status of African American criticism now. Uh, Tony K. Bambara made transition in the mid-90s, uh, 95, and this was nearer the end of her life in the early 90s when she gave this interview. And she said, however, she said, there's nobody, there's nobody who is more uh, adept, more skilled, more talented, more gifted in terms of thinking through and with our artists in terms of how to comment about culture than Eleanor Trailer. She said, there's nothing being written in African-American criticism today 
It's so funny that you know, she could turn a phrase, uh, Tommy K. Bombara. She said, There's nothing being written now. I've read nothing in African American criticism that is anywhere near as smart and as insightful and as brilliant as things that Eleanor Trailer says off the top of her head quite casually. <laughs> so, in other words, and I can vouch for that, knowing Eleanor Trailer, having spent a great deal of time with her having been her chauffeur on uh, several, more than several occasions, uh, you know, as she goes out and does her errands and sitting with her at her house or in her office. Uh, and of course, you know, it's against the law to smoke indoors in Washington, D.C., but if you come down the hall or used to come down the hall at the trailer's office on campus at Howard University, you smell the smoke, yeah, that the trailer is in there, and ain't nobody going to tell her she can't smoke. But um, Ellen, the trailer has a piece in this piece, Savoring the Salt, and she says, uh, she quotes Tony K. Bombar in an essay she wrote called Salvation is the Issue. And she says, stories are important. They keep us alive. In the ships, in the camps, in the quarters, fields, prisons, on the run, underground, under siege, in the throes, on the verge. The storyteller snatches us back from the edge to hear the next chapter in which we are the subjects. We, the hero of the tales. Our lives preserved how it was how it be passing it along in the relay that is what i work to do to produce stories that save our lives that's eleanor trailer quoting her friend tony k bombar in this collection saving the salt and so when we think about biggie we think about tupac we think about kendrick lamar just reading john karamaka's review critic of the new york times who does a lot of review on music yesterday's paper he was uh was it yesterday the day before he was uh reviewing kendrick lamar's new album and he said you know it was brilliant but uneven and, and i'm thinking about it this was an excellent social structure review you don't have anything to say about any of this that i'm particularly interested in reading but i just want to see what you're thinking and as usual you missed the complete mark because you see when dr trailer quotes tony cage she's saying our stories our view and to save our lives what is the objective as sonia sanchez another comrade and friend of both of those women i just named and claudia tate and Cheryl wall and janet holmes these black women are no joke fair griffin you know i get to start talking about these sisters are Dana Williams. I'll start giving y'all names. These are black women, women writers, women uh, artists, women critics who convene. They all know each other. It's very, it's very, very much a, a very thing. In fact, they just came back from Rutgers. As I said, Cheryl Wall is now an ancestor. They just convened up there a few weeks ago to kind of initiate uh, an, an endowment in her name and continue her work. But at any rate, uh, when they come together, it's to save our lives. How do it free us? How do it free us? And uh, you know, it's one thing to be very adept in describing things as they are. And it's one thing to be very adept to in describing things as uh, you have experienced them. Beginning a Juicy Fruit win. when Christopher Wallace said, I'm just out here trying to feed my daughter. OK, if you didn't have that African thing in you, you wouldn't be worried about feeding your daughter. And Gil Scott Heron, two generations before in uh, Inner City Blues says you know y'all don't beat up these black women out here doing what they got to do she said you looked at this hungry baby and some decisions had to be made in other words yes it doesn't make any sense to beat them up for that however as tony Cade would say and she said we talked about this monday night the job of the artist is to make revolution irresistible and she said the job of the storyteller is to save lives so it isn't just about the thing that you have experienced and the thing as it is what is the thing that must be and can be that's what Kasula is telling Zora Neale Hurston. That's what Tony Cade is writing in the Salt Eaters. That's what we talked about Monday night. And finally, Prof, that's what that young sister Janae brought to us as an artist who said, you know, I, damn, I, I like Kendrick's earlier album before last. This one, I'm really trying to... See, that's somebody who is practicing her craft like you practice your craft how does it free how i'm trying to say what we're, we're trying to save our lives what story is going to save my life not just to me so yeah i know that place yeah i know that feeling uh, oh i said one but let me say this one other thing i was watching again these cats these young boys in this in when i say young boys it was actually older hip-hop artists you talk about wise intelligence these are cats in their 40s and 50s and they were talking about uh, you know who it was? Uh, what's the brother? Man, talk about five percenters. What's our man from Brand Newbie and who's all over the internet? He used to be with uh, what's that? Uh, that uh, that that parasite's name? Uh, Vlad. What's the name? Oh, I can't think. I can't think. Oh, I see his face all the time. But anyway, I'm thinking Brand Newbie. And if I stop for a minute and stop talking, he was in Oz 
Or anyway, somebody will come up with the Nubians will come up with it. I'll look in the chat. Um, but at any rate, Lord Jamar. <laughs> yes, thank you. The Lord Jamar came to me. <laughs> Lord Jamar was like, you know, you know, he'd be talking. They all sitting around talking. He said, you know, see, we need we need hip hop for our generation because <laughs> we still around. We're going to be talking about different things. And then they start talking about Jay-Z 444 and they start talking about, in other words, every generation, you can still be a hip hop artist, but you shouldn't be talking about the same thing these boys are talking about. And a math Hoff, I think it was, this is one of his, his, one of the things, his podcast. He was like, yeah, because we ain't in the street no more. Nah, so you should be talking about being in the street. We talking about, I need I need some hip hop about my daughter. I need some hip hop about raising children. I need some hip hop about, yeah, and, and I'm just saying that to say that, you know, the idea of keeping us alive and having a vision, it isn't and shouldn't be about an attempt to stay in the same place. We are not, after all, Mick Jagger. Who wants to be 80 years old talking about brown sugar? <laughs> you know what well, the Europeans. Why? Because it's the same mentality that says, I got to get plastic surgery because I never want to be old. You people are sick. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I don't mean individual. I mean this culture. So anyway, I just met, thought about that in terms of the artist role. <laughs> Go ahead. I popped in because when you were reading the, 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 the relay race. Yes. The relay race. Yes. What are you handing off? What are you handing off? So, I mean, that, that has to be Ooh. like, Hey, what am I handing off? Am I am I handing us off to go further? Are we going backwards? Are we running in place? If I hand you a baton, I want to win. I need you to get around faster than the, I need you to go further than I've gone. I'm handing you the baton so that we don't stay in place, right? That's what the relay race is all about, right? Bars, so bars. You got to put that on a shirt. You be dropping bars. I mean, I'm just you you read that and I was like, yes. That's the what race, race. Race. Cole said. I got my thing. I moved my thing. Now, guess what? Everybody graduating. I, done, I already got y'all out in corporation papers. She's now, handing what, off the what you bring, But what's, what's the business that you're bringing into the community that's going to bring us to the yes. next place? Yes. Ooh. Oh. Mm. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? Especially when we are in a society where we are under constant attack. And our skills have to be cultivated in governance formations that resist those social structures, which are very much about the individual, which are very much about individual success, success and achievement. And like I say, Monday night, as we were talking, those of you who are not in there, just understand this is it's a transformative space. As you say, probably it's not a book club. And we kind of kind of got into reading. And but those are points of departure. And to hear that conversation about how we move. This question of passing on the baton. You're right. That That's something that I think that should be. Again, this is difficult accretive work. That's why even in, in, in having conversation about Tony K, particularly as Janae was talking, I was pulling other things. And one of the things I read out of the interview is how she talked about Tony K. Bambara, that developing craft in a classroom or learning is a slow process and it requires an investment of time and patience, what Asa here would call content mastery. And as we develop those capacities, we then get out of people's way and people shine. As Malcolm X of Haj Malik El Shabazz, uh, Brother Omawale, as he was given a name by students from the West African Student Union, as he traveled through West Africa and he, uh, London wasn't allowed to land and, and get off the plane in France, uh, had spent time in West Africa and in Nigeria, Omawale, the son who had returned home, the one who returned home. The name he had gotten. He talks about the fact that once you help people discover, provide for them, orient them in the tools, the soil you talked about at the very beginning a few minutes ago in terms of our young brother Tupac Amaru Shakur, Shakur. Once you ground them in that soil, they will come up with the correct solution for the problems that face them collectively. And this is the thing. You got to trust people. But it isn't just trust. You got to help people. And so, you know, reading about the slutty vegan restaurants from a sister who grew up in the mean streets in some ways of Baltimore, who went south to Atlanta, whose father came out of the Caribbean, 
we understand that these artificial boundaries and borders that this social structure has drawn in order to exploit the human beings who are often trapped within them should mean nothing to those of us who want to move collectively and then pass that information on. And we li we're doing it finally in a social structure that wages war against that very concept of collective work for human transformation. Because human transformation, when it confronts a social structure that is anti-human, then becomes a struggle for human liberation. Understand, liberation is not the destination. Liberation is the uh, is the necessary step on the way to transformation. And, for, and while we are working for liberation, we are transformed even in that work. Again, the life of Tony K. Bambara and so many others shows us that. But understand that you know, the idea is so that is that one day you don't have to fight to live. So the idea of struggle being your identity is something we should be very careful before we embrace because that could become the only thing you have and are. And the response to it, as far as I'm concerned, can't be anchored in this concept of black joy either. And I don't mean black joy is a bad thing. I mean that in a society, in a social structure where the individual is seen as the uh, as the kind of standard of how we should think about existence, way of knowing, then black joy can be practiced as an individual practice. And that's just simply unacceptable. As Tony, as Tony K. Bambara said, and we talked about this Monday night, Tony K. Uh, wrote in one of her pieces that, in fact, it's in The Black Woman. When we talk, we spent a lot of time Monday night, uh, even though we just read two pieces by Tony K., we brought in all her other stuff, and I think I put those back up. But anyway, The Black Woman, the uh, collection that she edited in 1970, Tony K. talks about the idea when she writes a whole essay, because this is during the period of the, of the so-called uh, feminist movement. You want to talk about second wave and third wave feminism. Um, and uh, actually, the article is anchored in this uh, explosion of birth control and contraceptives availability in black communities. And she said, I have no illusion as to why that stuff is there. I think they probably trying to control the number of black people coming out. He said, but that ain't the point. The point is women should be able to control the decisions they make, but they shouldn't be making those decisions as individuals. They should be making those, uh, those decisions as individuals that are part of a collective, beginning with the brothers. And she said, our move in black liberation must be to turn toward each other, not away from each other. That was profound. <laughs> wow. Is it no? So the criticisms, the, the the arguments, the consensus building, the whole struggle to come co together collectively must be a turn inward to do that, not a turn outward and divide. But any any arguments, and there are plenty of them, and she goes through a number of them, which are quite salient. She said, you know, men are not going to tell us what to do with our bodies, but and we shouldn't be doing anything that is going to lead to a, a place where we damage ourselves or the community. And you shouldn't want us to do anything. In fact, this whole thing comes back to how do our selves connect to other selves? I mean, it was a brilliant, a brilliant, brilliant uh, excavation of that concept. But again, all of this is taking place in a very hostile environment. So here we are on the 21st of, of May, 2022 in this Western calendar. And we are and have so far for the first 30 minutes or so of our time together today, evoked the name of people whose lives were cut short. Many of them, whether it be through the cancer that ravaged the body of Tony K. Bombara, whether it be uh, the bullets that took the lives of Christopher Wallace and Tupac Shakur, whether it be the bullets that took the life of Malcolm X. Um, only Tony K lived to see her fifth decade of life. Among that quartet, two of them dead in their mid-20s, early 20s in Biggie's case, and Malcolm at 39. We understand that the circumstances that led to all four of those deaths 
were they preventable? Well, who knows in terms of genes, but I tell you one thing, it's very clear that we live in a society that is anti-life in terms of the food we put in our bodies. We mentioned that in passing when I was talking about uh, Raj Patel's book here um, on the relationship between racism, colonialism, and health. And in the case of Malcolm, in the case of Tupac, in the case of Biggie, of course, we're talking about people who were killed at the hands of other people who looked like them whatever else the circumstances that surrounded them and to evoke chris rock i mean you talk about you know tupac and biggie were assassinated now they were shot and i'm not saying that there weren't political circumstances there weren't beefs that were real and there weren't beasts that were imagined and contrived by uh, the same society where john carmichael can pass some criticism uh, value to criticism on kendrick lamar it's the same society that built up the east coast west coast mess you know, this is a market driven culture and conflict sales. So there are no friends and people who are claiming they're your friends are in it for the profit. Uh, check O'Shea Jackson, Ice Cube, No Vaseline, his critique of Jerry Heller, among others. But the point is that, you know, at some point we have to call this thing for what it is. And prof, you know, we thinking about this week since we've been back together in the world people are now moving back out in the streets in greater and greater numbers and the covid numbers have decided oh y'all back out okay here you go what that, that's covid we're gonna give you some more covid this <laughs> and, and uh, now the monkey box. did you see this monkey box? i did and i'm holding my breath quite I'm literally <laughs> i said monkey pox hey we're not going. This is not going. These are waves. Yeah. Wait. So somebody, uh, some high level official said there's zero percent chance that monkeypox is going to spread. And I was like, that means there's a hundred percent chance. A hundred. That monkeypox is going. Is going to spread. Right. Don't even. Right. Right. That's exactly right. Whatever you say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't believe what Ren say, because <laughs> he going out like Kunta Kinte. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let me not. I got ice cube in the head now. <laughs> last last week we were in class with Carl. We had no idea at the time that uh, ten beautiful people were. Uh, Hold on, let me, yeah, here we go. Uh, we had no. We had. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get in the app. We had no idea. I, yeah. was that, the next day. No, it was that day. It was that day. It was Saturday. It wasn't Sunday, right? No, it was Saturday. Sunday is when it all came out. But we were sitting in class while this Cretan drove four hours, waited overnight, scoped out, went on Google search, which is why you know that, you know, um, that manifesto that you, you so are, I mean, you masterfully broke down on Monday and I refuse to break it down on the social structure uh, outlet that I'm on Monday, wow. Friday. But I, um, I was like, we were in class while that was going on. And that's so shopping and minding their business. And cause it was early, you know, we do this early morning, eight thirty, nine o'clock sometimes. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, that's true. And, and 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 we won't go through it again today because so much has been done there. But we, we do want to mention a few things because you're right. Monday night, we kind of went through it. We went through it enough and we won't repeat that here. Uh, but for folks who are not yet in the space that where we have the Nubia and haven't yet joined narrative, what we did was and I sat with I read the manifesto. You know, it, it's kind of a thing in three movements and it's been done now so many times. There's no need to rehearse all that now. Um, the kind of there's a plurality of it that is about in great detail. The ammunition, the guns, the helmet, the the, the, the Kevlar vests and the different type where you can purchase them, how you can modify the gun. All that stuff is there page after page after page after page. But the beginning of the document and the end of the document, including question and answers, lay out quite clearly that this boy was not an outlier. The people he is citing the are very much in the center of the white supremacist social structure. And, and let's be very clear about that uh, because we had, since we were together, since even Monday when we were all together, Tuesday, we had the uh, primaries around the country and we saw the white nationalist party pick its champions for the upcoming midterm elections, local, state, federal election. And I said midterm in the federal sense. And a number of uh, the ultra-right 
white nationalists won the candidate for governor in Pennsylvania, for example, North Carolina. You saw this and people are now, you know, cracking jokes. And, and, you know, this is the thing we had to be clear about in terms of the illusion. Um, people are saying, well, Trump's candidates did not have a clean sweep. Madison Cawthorn was defeated in North Carolina. And said, no, Trump didn't start white nationalism. He rode it to success. He gave it a focal point and a voice temporarily. I'm looking at this, uh, the first out of the gate in terms of trying to profit from his cowardice, Mark Esper, former Secretary of Defense, who is now making the rounds on the talk shows and white people talking to white people as if this guy isn't a criminal with the rest of them. And, you know, it's funny because in one sentence, he'll say, well, you know, I, I didn't say anything. I mean, because, you know, he would have fired me and this, I, we were the firewall. OK, let's accept that. OK, so when you had that uh, donkey eared clown Juan Guaido in the White House and meeting with him with the pretend, with the suggestion that you somehow overthrow the Venezuelan government, where does that fit? Now, these are white people asking other white people things. They're supposed to be on two sides of the political spectrum, but they all agree that Venezuela must be destabilized. Okay, well, that means you're an open enemy of humanity. And Esper is with y'all on this. This is what Malcolm is saying, the fox and the wolf, y'all the same thing, right? But, you know, people misread Malcolm, I think, on this, which is why we're gonna spend the balance of time today uh, two days after Malcolm's birthday, dealing with Brother Malcolm. But the point I'm trying to raise is that, you know, we have to understand that this murderer who went to Buffalo is part of the same fabric of the voters who voted for white nationalists on Tuesday. And it's just part of the same fabric of a social structure where whiteness and white nationalism is the organizational logic of the society. So people say, well, you know, he's he's quoting um, he's quoting um, Tucker Carlson. Now, I read the document. Tucker Carlson's name is not mentioned. Tucker Carlson trying to scramble and say, oh, he's crazy. He's crazy. Yeah, you crazy, too. Both of y'all infected with white nationalism. And no, your name doesn't appear in the document, literally. <laughs> but conceptually, you're absolutely there. And then the president of the United States. Oh, what do you say, Pro? No, I was just laughing. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, you know, the president of president of the United States, Joe Biden, gets up a couple days ago and says, you know, there's this ultra MAGA. Okay. You're a soft white nationalist too, Joe. But the mistake we make is, is in thinking somehow that any of you all are like avatars in a war versus good and evil, and we should be picking sides. No, all of you are tools. All of you are tools. And when you say ultra MAGA, Help me, bro, because, you know, you're a writer, you're English uh, trained, uh, in English academic, and you train writers. When you say ultra MAGA, does that make ultra adjective? <laughs> is that, I don't know. I'm saying, because MAGA mean <laughs> white now. What is an ultra MAGA? I'm trying to understand. Well, you said it. You know, Joe's a soft, soft white nationalist. I'm not like that. Ultra is going to get up, drive four hours, wait overnight. Oh. Gun down people, put the N-word on my gun. I'm going to put a number 14 on there for the 14 words. I'm going to actually do something about it. I'm going to go out and, and wear, wear my khakis and whip my tiki torch. That's ultra mega. The ultra. rest of us just deny rights and, you know, sit back and watch it happen. The rest right. of us. But that's, right. We're not ultra. So we're no less or more. We're no less dead from inaction, <laughs> we are from action, but within the camp, they'll make a distinction. I didn't shoot nobody. Right. No, all you did was make sure that they could get the gun. I don't use the N word. You know, I don't use the N word. Yeah, I don't, I, just, use, <laughs> I don't use the N word. I just give out Pulitzers to people who do. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's all right. Meanwhile, Tony Cade and them been fighting a war saying, no, these stories gotta be different. That we could all use the N word. And without betraying any confidences, I've seen some of the people who we would say, oh, these are great culture keepers. They absolutely are and can cuss in ways that are as brilliant as anything you ever read, read that they wrote. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They can use a cuss word, but they don't in certain contexts. As the Yoruba people would say to Udo Ifa, at least, you know, I think about my man, uh, Shagun Badageshi, the former dean of arts and sciences at, at Howard University, my man, a philosopher, African philosopher. He said, you know, to make a point, you don't have to use up all the words in your mouth. In other words, this is the point of narration. This is the point of storytelling. This is the point of study and being able to choose, as Aikwe Arma writes about the ancient Egyptians. He said, when you read Egyptian literature, you understand that, you know, 
you choose the best words. You only choose the right words. And when you think about Africana language systems, you choose the best words to make the point and the choices you make are with a purpose in mind. It's very important to understand. So, um, yeah, um, Trump didn't start white nationalism. He wrote it to his individual success. We saw in Ohio, J.D. Vance, who was running for the United States Senate. Who created J.D. Vance? There's a long article in the, in the Times. Oh, I don't know if I, I don't, I don't need to pick. I don't need to pull it up now. Earlier in the week, you know, J.D. Vance, who wrote that book, Hillbilly Elegy, that was made into a movie by Ron Howard, had Glenn Close in it. I was laughing out loud reading this article in the New York Times that talked about the fact that who created J.D. Vance? It was the people you call the liberals. Because they said, well, finally, here's somebody with, an, with a mind who has a window into how these white nationalists are thinking, but he is now reformed. Did he say he reformed? Oh, yeah, he did say he don't trust Trump. He's a never Trump. Oh, yeah. And then he turned around and went right back to his white nationalist roots. And now he is running uh, in the for United States Senate. He'd probably, he'd probably be in the United States Senate if you don't go out and vote. Now, Malcolm said you should exercise the vote. Wait, oh, wait, Malcolm didn't say that. OK, we're going to read what Malcolm said. I'm going to be about two more minutes. We're going to get to Malcolm. Right. Because we need to understand everything we're talking about in this context. Here we are two days after Malcolm X's birthday, uh, a few days before African Liberation Day, which is always the 25th of May every year began. In 1958, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, we talked about that extensively uh, last year, it was now the year before last. But at any rate, um, here we are in uh, the uh, in the moment when we've seen this slaughter and we've, we're going to see in action. And here we are a couple of days before the second anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. We saw another one of those cops take a plea this 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 week that will give him significantly reduced jail time that he was be exposed to on state charges. And we understand that even just two years after, Charles Blow had an article in today's New York Times, today's paper, where he said, you know, people have already forgotten or started to forget. Well, they didn't forget, Charles. With all due respect, brother, they are exhaling. Because two years ago, this week, they were afraid there was going to be a whole ass rebellion. And all the people who think that we shouldn't be coordinating our global efforts at liberation struggle, leading to our ability to transform ourselves as a collective humanity. Remember that the, the eyes of the world, people were marching in the streets at George Floyd's funeral in Houston. They live streamed from Accra, Ghana, as they added his name and image to the wall of ancestors in Accra with Breonna Taylor. Come on now. We're in the liminal space right now. Two years ago, George Floyd was still alive, but Breonna Taylor was gone. Ahmaud Aubrey was gone. And two years since, Amir Locke was killed. So many other people have been sent to the ancestors. And this white deputy cop, and he's what he is. In fact, in the manifesto, what the boy said was that, yes, the boy said that, I hope I don't kill any law enforcement officers because they are just doing their jobs. They're doing the best they can. Why did he say that? He said, because he, because he's a deputy law enforcement officer. He, he was born with his uniform. It's called whiteness. And you can reject that uniform, but that comes at a cost too, as John Brown. So the whole point I'm trying to make is that um, we don't make the distinctions we need to make in terms of social structure and governance structure. And one of the main reasons, in fact, the anchoring reason that we worked so hard to generate what we are now labeling this Africana Studies conceptual category framework is so that we can have points of entry that allow us to think for ourselves. As Malcolm also said famously, you see this one on the t-shirts among other, many other Malcolm uh, X quotes of all our studies, history is the best prepared to reward all research. Well, what that simply means is that as we study, as we listen, as the Egyptians might say, Sajim, to listen, to hear, to internalize what has been received, we can then make better decisions. 
And so what the conceptual categories framework allows us to do is to ask better questions. And then through our work, our collective discussion of what we've done. And again, Monday is getting better and better week after week after week, just deeper and more intense. And people are sharing and in the chat. People are talking. People are coming into the, the, the vocal conversation. What we find is that we come up with our solutions. So what I wanted to do today, just for a few minutes, is talk a little bit about Malcolm X. And to talk about him very specifically, not the Nation of Islam years, not the years as Detroit Red, not the years growing up in Lansing or his birth in Omaha. Prof, you know, we, we, we talked about that extensively. There's a, there's a long conversation we had, not the circumstances that surrounded his uh, killing, his assassination. We talked about that, too, uh, extensively. You know, all that's archived. Folk can go back and look at it. Uh, Yuri Kochiyama, we talked about her extensively, uh, his comrade, his sister, and, and all of those things. What I want to do is focus very specifically for a few minutes today. And I want to pause here before I do. I'm going to talk about something, a talk he gave on April the 8th, 1964. This is a talk that Malcolm gave that has been labeled the Black Revolution. And if you have a copy of Malcolm X Speaks, the book Malcolm X Speaks and it's widely available. Now, yeah, selected speeches and documents. This is a uh, Pathfinder Press, 1965, and then republished 1989. Betty Shabazz, uh, joint copyright there with Pathfinder. Um, it is on page 45. It's called The Black Revolution on April 8th, 1964, which means less than a year before he was assassinated. Malcolm X gave a speech. On the Black Revolution at a meeting sponsored by the Militant Labor Forum in Palm Gardens in New York. Uh, the audience was about 75% white. George Brightman writes that most of it responded favor favorably to the talk, but there were some sharp exchanges during the discussion period between the speaker and white liberals who resented his attacks on liberalism and the Democratic Party and tried to pin the label of hate monger on him. Now, if you want to read that the exchange, it's not in this book, Malcolm X Speaks. This only has the speech. The question and answer period is in this book by any means necessary. This is a collection of Malcolm uh, Malcolm X's speeches, some of his uh, an interview with our brother A.B. Spellman, who still walks the earth, my man A.B. Spellman. Um, a lot of question and answer stuff that going on. And this actually, you see, section two is answers to questions at the militant labor forum. So the speech is in Malcolm X speeches speaks the back and forth question and answer is in by any means necessary. We're not going to spend much time on question and answer, probably not much at all. But I do want to get to what he said, because this in so many ways resonates during this week where we're going to see and we have already seen the social structure in the United States work, work heavily to do a couple of things. Number one, to isolate this boy in Buffalo. And make him an outlier to label him as a white extremist. See, he's a white nationalist, as if they're not, in terms of a white nationalist system. And remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when the New York Times did their three-part series on Tucker Carlson called American Nationalist. And I said, uh, yeah, you left out a word. American white, uh, white nationalist, right? There, this is why. Because you saying American nationalist as if... Uh, American and white aren't coterminous. They mean the same thing as Toni Morrison once said, you know, everybody, white doesn't need the same thing. You say American, everybody else got to hyphenate African-American, even white ethnics who haven't yet assimilated into whiteness have to, you know, assimilate into whiteness. But whiteness, you don't have to say anything. You say American nationalist. Okay, well, I think you need to put white in there. Why? Because you see, and here we are. This boy got the playbook. And he's executed. So what the first of the two things they're going to do is try to say, OK, we're well, isolated. This is an outlier. We didn't know. Oh, my God, this is terrible. We're going to condemn. We're going to condemn. Yeah, OK, the second thing. Is to move very quickly with business as usual. We can never afford. And we have never been able to afford to just allow ourselves to move through the world as a business because business as usual means modernity business and usual business as usual means black death business as usual means white supremacy which is global local 
variations, adjustments on a global phenomenon. And we're seeing and more and more of us are saying it now. We're reaching that kind of tipping point. And Malcolm talks about this. But uh, at Monday night, we finished up. And a few hours later, I was headed for the first time. I, I think I, I, I keep thinking that I, I think it's my first time in uh, New York since COVID hit. And I went because uh, Sister uh, Mama Latrella Thornton, who was a member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, um, following the instructions of our elder, now ancestor, Mama Kefa Neptis, who with her uh, husband, Bill Jones, uh, created something in Harlem called the First World Alliance, which was the study group. And I talk about that more in a second and we get to Malcolm. Uh, Mama Keppa made transition uh, almost seven years ago. And we went to New York for the ritual of initiation. Uh, and her body was interred. But she was in a, a cemetery, a nice cemetery, but not the place she wanted her remains to rest for eternity. So she, basically, uh, Mama Latrella would not rest until that was made right. And so on Tuesday in Westchester County, in Ferncliff Cemetery, we uh, convened to have her reinterred near her comrade, Yosef Benyakinen, who is buried in Ferncliff, uh, whose body is buried in Ferncliff as he is an ancestor. Other members of the First World Alliance who are interred there and uh, in Ferncliff. Also, Adolf Caesar, the actor. James Baldwin is in Ferncliff. Cab Calloway is in Ferncliff. Ozzy Davis and Ruby D are in Ferncliff. Mom, Mom's Mabley is in <laughs> Ferncliff. Uh, Jam Master J, Thelonious Monk. Khaled Muhammad is in Ferncliff. Uh, Whitney Young is in Ferncliff. Paul and Essie Robeson are in Ferncliff. And finally, for the first time, I'm embarrassed to say, because every year, Baba James... Small, who then was back in Ferncliff two days later on Thursday the 19th, the birthday of Malcolm X, takes buses of African people to the gravesite of one of his jegnas, Malcolm X, where Malcolm and Betty are buried at Ferncliff. And so for the first time, I was able to be there to uh, not for the ritual on the 19th, but that Tuesday afternoon after we finished with our ritual for Mama Keffa, which was a beautiful thing to tell you about African people. OK. As you can imagine, the, the, the people who dig the graves, the people who tend the yards, they are not white people. Uh, many of them from the Spanish speaking community, various nations of Central America, Caribbean. And the grave diggers, the attendants stood there as we convened Leonard Jeffries and Rosalind Jeffries, Camille Yarborough, so many others. So many others. Uh, my brother Reggie Mabry, Sister Genevieve, Genevieve Morales, so many others. The drummers, master drummers. Oh my God, these cats are being no joke. So we were there. We did libation. We did the rituals. All the opening of the mouth is the Egyptian ritual. Baba James Small did that. And you saw these cats. They were kind of standing because once we finished, of course, then they do what they have to do to, you know, finish the internment. And they standing behind, but then they didn't leave. A lot of times, you know, they got work. They, they see there's other funerals going on. You know, now, oh, well, by the way, Aaliyah is there as well. Aaliyah's in the mausoleum where Cap Calloway is. Cap Calloway is. But at any rate, to watch them stand there and kind of get pulled into that energy was a beautiful thing. And after we finished the ritual, and we were walking, I was walking over to where Malcolm and Betty are, are interred. And and I paused to the brothers. I said, thank you all, man. Thanks for this. And they were like, oh, yeah, man, of course. It is. And you could tell <laughs> there was an energy there. I said, again, these are things we do for our ancestors. But anyway, I raised that because, you know, standing here and then leaving, leaving Ferncliff. And I like to ride. So, you know, I like to kind of move quietly. It was Biggie's birthday, you know, um, the Ten Crack Commandments. <laughs> I like to move in silence and violence. So at any rate, you know, I, I come to town. I'm going to get on the train, get on the bus. I'll just tell me where to be and what time I'll be there. Don't worry about picking me up. No, no, no. And so it was fascinating for me, you know, leaving 
uh, that's Square Garden, you know, getting on the one, going uptown, 242nd, getting off there, Van Cortland Park, getting on the bus and then riding through. And you see the farther away you get from the city, the more idyllic the little towns become. They where the police live. We're going through Westchester County, right? Anything y'all know where the Mets and the Yankees and them live, right? But these little towns, you know, what's the name of that one town? Something on Hudson. Anyway, you see the Hudson River coming. <laughs> and I'm thinking about how Du Bois writes about the Houston Tonic and West Massachusetts. He's a, he's Hudson, little, Hudson on the Croton, Hudson on the Croton, because uh, ter- Tony Tony Morrison lived on one of those. Hudson yeah. River. Oh no question. Ooh, yes, ma'am. That's right. Because you can see, I mean, the little town, the little town squares, the little barbershop and the cafe, and it's getting wider and wider and wider. And I'm just, this is great. Then I got off at the stop and walked the kind of half mile to the cemetery it's idyllic and i think wow this is and i think about talk about cab calloway who's buried in fern cliff and i think about how you know another son of baltimore like sister cole these baltimoreans but uh i think about how james brown bought a house in one of them little communities and uh, count basie and them lived out here and how the children james brown when he was in town would kind of convene the kids and how it it, it built community, but they they basically blockbusting, and he's bringing culture in. Louis Armstrong did something very similar in Queens, and having stood in his modest house, he and Louise in Queens, you know, when he was in town, did all the neighborhood kids would come for ice cream? He'd give them music lessons. And wherever we are as African people, we build community. And again, this question of you at the beginning, the baton, how do we pass that baton on? It's very important to understand that where we go, we bring our culture with us, and everybody benefits. What is the reason? Why are you in this space? But at any rate. In the case of Armstrong, somebody like that in that neighborhood, Monk lived in that neighborhood, uh, Dizzy Gillespie lived in the neighborhood in Queens, kind of around. Well, now, you know, they're all ancestors and they're physical moraines. Armstrong and uh, and, uh, uh, and and Miles Davidson are in another cemetery, very famous cemetery. But in this particular cemetery, Farncliffe, everybody I name, their physical moraines are there. And when we come in these rituals, we're convening those black spaces, those governance spaces, those ways of knowing spaces. The, what we did, those rituals are cultural meaning making. And in doing them over and over again, year after year after year after year, it's movement and memory. How do we keep this memory alive? And we say the name now. And when we say the name Malcolm X, we have our famous, our favorite Malcolm X quotes. But again, those are points of entry. Using our Africana Studies framework, we ask ourselves, who are we to each other? The governance question. And that question then must be answered by research because of all of our studies. When we research the past, when we research our memory, we are then rewarded with some insight as to what we might do now. Because again, as Tony K. Bombard is saying, Not only is it the job of the writer to make revolution irresistible, it's the job of restoring our memory, culture keeping, memory, deep memory to make revolution irresistible and to speak life so that we can live more abundantly. And it isn't just about liberation. It's about ultimately human transformation. But to get to that transformation, we must have liberation. So Malcolm, on April the 8th, he gives this talk called The Black Revolution and he says, friends and enemies. Tonight, I hope that we can have a little fireside chat with as few sparks as possible being tossed around, especially because of the very explosive condition that the world is in today. This is 2022. No, 1964. Okay, I get confused. Sometimes. Okay, and Prof, (laughs) you threw a, a question out earlier in the week about fire and a house. I'm putting this on you <laughs> because this is what led me to go think about Malcolm's question. Help, help us with that. What <laughs> this is what led me to speech right now. Go ahead. In the chat, our brains must be linked because I was just going to type Aaliyah and then you brought up Aaliyah. I was like, I, I couldn't even get the A out. I didn't even see. Don't matter because we here. No, but I didn't type it because I was like, well, he already said it. Um, yeah, I, I went in there too. Uh, with the pl- one oh, thing about them places, have you ever? It is it's cavernous. I, I did a whole um graveside tour on Black History Month for uh Social Structure Daily News, uh, of all of the where Black people were buried in Ferncliff, of course. You know, really, gotta be in Ferncliff, yeah. Um, but you know, I went to Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, is you know, it's like some amazing uh resting places, and I did a graveside piece with pictures and stuff. But um, no, no, we're, we're, we're gonna move from that. We, I'm gonna talk to our friend Tabby Gibson. You know, this is another thing. We're gonna have to reconvene that. 
Yeah, we no, were talking about this very thing in the cemetery. I told Latrella, we need to come and do. But now that you've done it, okay, another <laughs> you get the good work reward, more work. We're gonna need you to do that one again. <laughs> wow. So I I um pulled the 1962 speech because you know there the clips of it. Who taught you to hate yourself? You know, the black woman's the most disrespect. That comes from a, a speech that's 39 minutes long. So I sat with that speech and it came on the heels of a a uh, patty roller police uh, decimation of a mosque in Los Angeles and the killing of the secretary of that mosque. And the, I mean, well, folks, shot him in the head. Shot That's him right. Point blank in the, in the heart, Dr. Carr. Point blank. Oh, heart, right. And right. then put him on the ground in handcuffs face down. That's what they do. So that happened in April. In May, the day after his birthday, Malcolm gives a speech in Los Angeles. And in that speech were all of the things that, you know, we know him for, you know, a lot of the things that we know him for. But I think he made a reference to a house burning. And then I was thinking about King because we just finished. Where do we go from here? Community of Chaos. Uh, and King's last conversation with Harry Belafonte was, I fear I've integrated my people into a burning house. And I was like, they both were talking about the house is on fire. That's right. So I just I went on Twitter. I, you know, I asked a question on the radio and I didn't get an answer. You did. Just, no, nah, everybody calling up with their own because everybody's in their feelings. Emotions are real yeah. and, they, and we should lean into them. But I feel like there's a lot of work we should be doing with our um, therapist. I'm just saying uh, we need to do a lot of work with our therapist. So when we come into spaces to build, our brick is whole, not full of holes, not compromised. Mm -hmm. If we put this together and I gave the broken obelisk because Dr. Senyata in one Maroon's medicine chest went over the broken obelisk, the, the obelisk that they stopped building with because it had a crack in it because you do not build with cracked marble or granite yeah. in this case. You can't build something that's going to last thousands of years if it has a crack in it, if it has an infraction. And a lot of us are coming with bricks with infractions. It's not our fault. 400 years of of what they did on purpose is a damnable thing, but it's our responsibility to get healthy so that we can be whole enough to build for not us for the thousands of years after we're not here so that we can have uh, a future to stand on. Now, the question is in this criminal enterprise called America, the house is on fire. King saw it, Malcolm saw it. So my question was very simple. Do we put the fire out or do we get out of the house and just let it burn? You said something profound because I hadn't even processed that. I thought there were two options. The third option, Dr. Carson, tell them what your third option was. Oh, I, I just, I thought, I mean, well, you know, you can't, in terms of cultural meaning making, we are of a certain generation. Talk about passing the baton, things that endure. You could be 12 years old. And if you are a member of the community of African people, you know the answer when the roof is on fire. <laughs> exactly. And see, what I'm saying is what we saw in Buffalo, this is what black people are saying. We don't need no water. Let the mother ever burn. Burn, mother Burn. In other words, now these are, any of y'all ever been to a party where the roof is on fire? Come on, no. Ain't nobody going nowhere. Wait a minute. The roof is on fire. We don't, in other words, there's nothing that will happen in this place that can consume us. And of course, that was straight biblical. And thinking about that, that's, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can't do nothing to us. <laughs> you understand? But I mean, that's not what I, oh, well, I mean, about. we got to sit in all of that because you know, of rhetorically, <laughs> we're in the house. We are in the house. And 99.9% .9 of us are not going a damn place. Not for any other reason than uh, my, my people built this house. So I'm not leaving or I don't really have any place to go. And I'm just going to say out my mouth, colonized Africa to me is not a solution right now. Uh, maybe, Netflix, maybe that rich, black, whatever that foolishness is. Right. Maybe, maybe the Caribbean because there's an awakening there. I see that. But, you know, that then becomes a very easy target you know, for a Google map or a Google drone to look over, ah, these little islands, that becomes easy. We didn't, you know, until we develop Star Wars and Star Wars defense uh, system, and there's some techies out there that can do that. I'm not comfortable being in a place where it can just be Black Wall Streeted. No. Nah. Like well, no. there, no, there is no sheltered rear. This is something Paul Robeson was say. You know, th there is no place you can hide from this. Right. And, and as, we, as we read and talked about, again, if you're not in Nubia, I mean, 
th those weeks we spent with Dr. King and that last chapter, where do we go from here? Chaos of Community, where he writes about the world house. This is the environmentalist movement. You can't go anywhere because, you know, Curtis maybe says hell below. We all going to go. In other words, when this air messes up, when they messing up the air, that's the air you breathe, too. When you ride down and you got a mask on, everybody else got no mask on. They going to kill you. In other words, it doesn't. This is the world house. Mm. And so when we think about, again, again, just right quick, we use more one more time, the, the, the metaphor from Rockmaster Scott, the treacherous three, and the dynamic three, when the roof is on fire and we are in our cultural space, we don't need no water. Let them <laughs> burn. In other words, when it finished burning, we'll build another house or maybe we'll build the house we want because this roof is on fire. And guess what? You can't save it, Joe. Calling them ultra MAGA is not going to save you. And Madison, young Madison, now that I'm sure you're going to go off and make a million dollars a year at some cracker think tank where they pay you to do what you know. He calling it dark MAGA. Dark MAGA defeated us. OK, you doubling down. That's the same logic that your friend Tucker Carlson, that y'all's uh, child, this boy that killed these black these black people in Buffalo. Dark. So you. Somebody in, in the chat wanted to know because you you addressed this in office hours. Why you call him boy? Because he's a boy. In other words, it's uh, for several reasons. I'm not talking as a social structure facing in social fa structure facing commentary. I'm not closed off from social structure. We all live in this social structure. So, you know, interviews or conversations, I'm going to have conversations with whoever want to have conversations. But I'm going to, like August Wilson said, like Tony K. Bambara writes, I'm going to speak out of my grounding. And so, Trayvon Martin was a boy. Mike Brown was a boy. This boy is a boy. To me, I'm a man. And so, I'm saying, you could say, 17, 18, 19, you can look at a very um, kind of Western quantitative thing. So, or then the legal concept says age of 18 means he's a man. I know some of y'all in here are 60, 70, 80 years old. If you got a living parent, you always going to be a girl or a boy to them. And the reason I call him a boy is that's one reason. The other reason is that uh, when you read the manifesto, um, it's very clear to anybody who read it. I think everybody who's read it or who's read, part, read parts of it should come immediately clear. And Oz, Baba Oz said this yeah. on Monday night. He did not do this by himself. That if people say, oh, these guys crazy. Read it. This is not 18 year old writing. And this is somebody who at 57 years old has spent 30 plus years, 32 years grading papers of every race, of every person you can think of whether Temple, Ohio State, Howard University, you name it, community college, prisons, high school students, elementary school students, this boy didn't write that. Not by itself. Whether it was cut and paste, whether it's collaborated on, but that language, and I'm not just talking about the word choice, I'm talking about the concepts that are evoked. His notion of you know, the replacement theory, yeah, it ain't that simple, chief. Go read what he wrote. He's talking about distinctions between liberalism and conservatism and where there is really no distinction to be made. He's talking about the relationship of the global to the local. He and it ain't a rant now. You, you, some of y'all remember the Turner Diaries or you remember Timothy McVeigh's testimony when he blew up the, uh, uh, he and Terry, whatever his name is, blew up the Oklahoma uh, Federal Center and cleared all those kids, those children in a daycare center, two all those black and brown children. Yeah, you remember his testimony, right? This ain't that. Go read it. So another reason I call him a boy is because to uh, to reinforce the fact that he did not act alone. Yeah, he was in that parking lot and in that that that, that building alone, but he had help. He had help, unfortunately, from the damn dispatcher. <laughs> there was like even unintentional help. <laughs> but I'm saying he had some intentional help. And 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 ten years from now, or five years from now, or six months from now, when some well subsidized social structure reporter writes her book about this. And y'all go see the lecture and say, oh, this is better. You again have been falling for the banana in the tailpipe. We don't need no long excavation of his birth, his upright. Nah, he's part of a larger fabric. The roof is on fire. We don't need no water. 
<laughs> let the motherfucker burn. Joe, we don't need no water. In other words, what we're gonna what we not gonna do now is let you start trying to distance yourself from him. Either you do something or we swap you out for somebody who does, which is what Malcolm is saying in April 1964. This ain't Malcolm in the nation. <laughs> People say, well, the nation of Islam, the white man's devil. Nah, you don't get off that easy. Y'all act like Malcolm changed when he went to Mecca. First of all, it wasn't the first time he went to Mecca. We talked about that. Second of all, he ain't changed a bit. These white boys was mad at him. He's he's at the militant forum talking to a three-quarters white audience. Remember, we talked about that when he was in Fan Lou Hamer in Harlem. But let's get to the point here. Let's get to this. This is let's get to this. It's very important to understand. When you raise the metaphor of the house on fire. The first thing I thought is this how you went out on social media says somebody give me an answer. And I'm sad, I'm, I'm sad to hear nobody came with an answer in that context. I'm sure they're filling up the chat now, newbie and answers. But the first thing I thought was when we say house, what do we mean? And you know, I'm standing in a cemetery with a bunch of African people with the remains of an elder who was she and her husband started something after watching Gil uh Noble. Another African buried in Ferncliff, the great Gil Noble. Gil Noble, uh, the great television hero, broadcast hero. And if you get a chance to get your hands on his autobiography, Black is the Color of My TV Tube, like it is, you know, alongside following in the wake of continuing the work of people like Ellis Hazlett and Soul. You know, black people used to have television shows where you actually did content. But anyway, we, we talked about that too. We had a previous one. But uh, Mama Keffa and Baba Bill were watching Gil Noble and he interviewed Yosef Benyakin. And this is the 70s, like 1976, 77. So they go to Dr. Ben in Harlem, say, man, we saw you talking about the African Gordon civilization. So Ben invites them over to start studying with him to his house in Harlem, his apartment. And so that's what they do. And out of that, they decide they want to spread it because other people are starting to come. So they established something in Harlem called the First World Alliance. This is the study group. I've been having this conversation with our brother Paul Coates about this very thing in terms of a previous iteration of study groups from his, from Dr. Ben's friend, John Henry Clark, from the 1930s and 40s, the Harlem History Club. It used to meet at the Harlem Y. In fact, while, I'm, while I mentioned Paul, let me shout out. These just came out. He just brought them back into print. Black Classic Press has republished Agents of Repression, the FBI's secret war against the Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement, Ward Churchill and Jim Vanderwall, and also the COINTELPRO papers, documents from the FBI's secret wars against dissent in the United States, Churchill and Vanderwall, and Paul, being Paul, reached out to Ward Churchill, uh, who wrote a new foreword, a tale of two books, where he now, in an extensive, I mean, this is, a lot, this is a long introduction where he writes about what has happened since these books came out. They were first published in 1990, republished in 2002, and now 2022, Paul Coates, Black Classic Press, BCP. Every time I see that on the spine, I think about Black Classic Press, a press with a lot of very old ideas, my man. Anyway, but in talking to Paul about the the question of how we tap into the knowledge systems. We were at Dr. Ben's funeral. Many, many, many times we've had this conversation in one way or another. And the First World Alliance was a study group. And this isn't universities. This isn't K-12. This is community grounded, community based, which is one reason why Kefa Neftis is a name we should all know this sister. Uh, Baba Bill made transition some years ago. Mama Kefa just kept going, kept going, kept going. You know, they, I'll never forget, and I told them that when we were standing at the graveside, I was like, you know, I was living in Columbus, Ohio at the time, the African Center for Study and Worship, and it was a member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, an ASCAC study group, and we would get tapes from Harlem, because they would record like the Nation of Islam does, and you sell them cassette tapes, some of y'all don't remember the cassette tapes, right? And... If somebody was going to New York, we would like bring back first world tapes, bring back first world tapes. So we would hear Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Marimba Ani, Francis Crest Welsing, Richard King, Jim Carruthers, Asa Hilliard, you name oh, over, over Edward Scobie, you know, Leonard Jeffries, you name over again, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark. Every year they would open up the lecture series, fall lecture series, summer lecture series, spring lecture series, boom, 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 boom. And when I went to New York in 1989, the clerk at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, 
my man Tony Brown, who now chairs the African States Department there at uh, and is your colleague at Hunter College, John, John Henry Clark's home department. Tony was in grad school at the time I was in law school. And that first Saturday, he took me to First World. It was like, man, this is the place that I get to see. I told him it was like when you listen to a, a, a baseball game or a basketball game on the radio growing up. And then you, y'all don't know about that, some of y'all young people, but, and then you actually go to a game and be like, damn, that's Henry Aaron. Or oh, so that's what, you know, these are people you, you don't even see them on TV. You listen to the ball game on the radio, right? So Mother Keffa stood up. I had heard her voice so many times on those tapes. Little short lady, chocolate color lady. Lucille Jones was her birth name. Changed her name to Keffa Neptis. Neptis, of course, the sister of our set, Nebhat. The dark ladies, chocolate color sister. She stand up in praise of African life. She said at the beginning, the opening ritual at the First World Alliance, whoever's going to speak, all the questions and answers in, ten, in a church on 145th and Convent, the place was packed. You could stand in room only. Dr. Clark was talking that day. So he'd sit down front. I said, I'm coming to see John Henry Clark. I don't come all the way from Columbus, Ohio. I'm living in Jersey City. I'm not going to miss this. And so uh, the place is packed. I walk right up to the front, sat on the ground next to the church pew. And then other people start coming. They sat on the ground. Why? Well, yeah, I, 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 I ain't got to sit in no bench. <laughs> Man. So, in praise of African life, these are these are black folk. There's some people who go to school there, but most of them people, working class people, they do whatever they got to do to survive through the week. Saturday, say first world, the finest minds in the African world from all over the African world, kind of first world, and so. You know, she would ask anybody in here pregnant. And you may see a sister or two. Today I was there as a sister. It was pregnant. Stand up. We praise the life and African woman, the eldest person. May we have permission to continue the rituals. Very powerful. So anyway, I'm saying I have to say that the roof is on fire. What have I got to do with it? Well, we're in a cemetery. It's not a black cemetery, but in the places where black people we value are, it's a black space. Now metaphorically we are in a social structure formation this isn't sakura which is not far from where our sister dr amen talked about the so-called unfinished obelisk the tekken of hatshepsut and i've stood there like she has many times you stand on an unfinished obelisk where they are in the red granite there in aswan and you take the granite and you pound on the granite until you have a line there and then you pour water in and you put uh, you let you put wood in and let it soak and get larger. And as it does, it begins to crack the granite so you can get in there and then you dig a little more. You dig a little more till you dig it out. And these are the great opsy. A Tekken is made of one piece of stone. It's not made of brick. Washington Monument looks like a Tekken, but it's made of brick. You stack the brick. By definition, that's not a Tekken. It's not an obelisk. You, you make it out of one piece of stone. And the and the thing about the unfinished obelisk, as you stand on it, you see the outline of the obelisk. They're, they're about halfway through. They've dug down the sides. You see the point shaping out. And they're going to start putting glyphs in. And then they notice, oh, there's a flaw in the stone. That's a crack. <sighs> okay. All right, let's find another place here. And then they go and start digging out the obelisk again. Why? Did they cry? Did they try to figure out how to, oh, maybe we can move around it? No, nah, it's cracked. Let's go. Ooh, the lesson of the unfinished obelisk. We got all the time in the world. Louis Armstrong was saying that song. We have all the time in the world. <laughs> you have all the time in the world. Time not yours anyway. Last point, say time ain't real, no how. Next time somebody asks you about time, you got all the time to do the right thing. And so in a space where we control our governance formations, the external circumstances become less important. The roof is on fire. We don't need no water. Meaning what? What is the ultimate objective? Now, in the case of a hip hop song in the golden age of hip hop, the objective is we all in here wet from sweat from dancing we in the middle of the damn song and here come the dj do root do root in other words let me alert you to the thing you should be worried about and then we remind you of the thing that centers us we don't need no water let them burn in other words the whole point is that is not the important thing see in this context when malcolm is speaking in april 1964 
he puts the context that we are talking about in an in a, even an even an extended context when he is at Ron, speaking over the after the assassination of Ronald Stokes by the LAPD. He is no longer in the nation of Islam, but he's talking that same strong talk. And what he's reminding us of is when he was just why in social media, I kind of responded the way I did to you, Prof, is that, you know, there is no house that can contain who we are that we don't be, that we didn't build. So the first question we have to ask, we say, well, if I integrated my people into a burning house. Okay. What's the house made of? The house made of white nationalism, white supremacy. Can the house be repaired? Okay, if it's a house, that means it's sitting on land, the world. In other words, it's sitting in an environment, right? Okay. And so the white nationalist roof, the white nationalist roof, the white nationalist roof is on fire. We don't need no water. Let them, first of all, who is we? You with us? Oh, we gotta we gotta patch this constitution. We gotta amend this constitution. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, here we go. Okay, well y'all y'all go do that. But as Dr. King said, be true to what you said on paper first. Why we need a Fourteenth Amendment? We got a Fifth Amendment. But you, you see, y'all keep double talk. And then when you decide to change the rules, you just change the rules. You got a guy look like us. His wife out here trying to overthrow the whole damn government. Every other day, come out with And then she came in. It's going to come out next week that she came up with a gun and said she's going to blast somebody's head out with. And he's still going to be sitting there ruling. Why? Because them rules don't mean nothing. Malcolm, on April 8, 1964, says, friends and enemies. Tonight, I hope we can have this little fireside chat with as few sparks as possible being tossed around, especially because of some of the very explosive conditions that the world is in today. Sometimes when a person's house is on fire, and someone comes in yelling fire. Instead of the person who is awakened by the yell being thankful, he makes the mistake of charging the one who awakened him with having set the fire. Okay, pause. Malcolm, hate monger. That's what they're going to say. Muhammad Ali, ungrateful hate monger. The only Negroes you want are the Negroes who are trying to help you put out the fire in your burning racist house. The men them Negroes turn inward and say, we are going to convene our spaces and our spaces once convened will take care of the rest of this. You get nervous. Why? Because they ain't going to help you put your fire out. You, you built that house out of inferior materials. Nick Saban, Nick, pause for 30 seconds. Nick Saban at the University of Alabama, coach of Alabama. He mad. He's saying Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M paid his players a million dollars piece. Then he, th then he pulled Deion Sanders' name into it at Jackson State. Deion, they paid a million dollars for this recruit. Nick, we know what you're doing. You're white nationalists in the heart of Dixie. We ain't said a damn thing as Kay Ivey and them damn white nationalists are trying to roll back Alabama to the 18th century. They don't even care about the damn 19th century. Yo, white slave master concern called the University of Alabama football program, the program, you ain't had nothing to say about that. In fact, if you did what I know the coaches at Ohio State did, because I taught them boys at Ohio State, then you probably told your players don't say nothing about the politics. Just get you out there and run that ball. But Dion has decided, I'm going to turn inward, as Tony K. Mabara would say, and I'm going to build something black at Jackson State. And I'm talking to the high school coaches. I'm saying, let them boys talk to me. I know what y'all do, because y'all are representatives of the white nationalists at Alabama, at Georgia, at University of Texas, and the Ohio State and Michigan. You don't even tell your athletes that we're on campus. But let me talk to them. And now this boy starting to listen. Oh, I could I could play for yeah, I could play for an all-star cornerback who made all the money in the world. Yeah, you let that happen in basketball. You let that happen in football. Them revenue generating blacks. See, I don't care about track and field like my former classmate Angela Williams, an Olympian uh, who people from Trinidad and Tobago from Jersey ran for Seton Hall. But the first two years she was in Tennessee is where I met her as a freshman at Tennessee State because she came to run for Ed Temple, who trained Wilma Rudolph. In other words, these boys and girls, these young women and men may decide, you know what, I'm going to go to Jackson State. I can learn to be a quarterback better from De uh, cornerback better from Deion Sanders anyway. And I get to be on a black campus and go to school with teachers who look like me and see all these black girls and black boys around here looking like me and eating the calf and nobody got everybody understand my jokes. And if they clown on me, it's for my accent or where I'm from, but it's all in a governance thing. So it's all love. I could do all that. Nick Saban like, oh, oh, then Deion said, you put my name in it. You really want you really want to have that conversation, Chief Rocker? Because, see, I know your roof is on fire. See, I know you want to talk about paying players. Do you really want me to have that conversation? 
I went to Florida State. I played in the league and I was a commentator. Do you really want to have a conversation, LaFella? Go find that damn Aflac duck because that's what you're going to be looking at. Because if I ever start talking, we don't need no water. <laughs> let them let the SEC burn. Let the Big Ten burn. Let the Pac-10 burn. Why? Because I'm in Jackson State, Sonic Boom of the South. They like the band better anyway. And guess what? If you want to do what a cover two is, if you want to know how to shut down and lock down a wide receiver, you're gonna learn it from Prime. And I can wear my hat sideways and nobody tripping because all their hats is on sideways too. And guess what? You won't even play us no more because who is Alabama? They ain't got no damn football team. Now I'm kind of worried about Alabama State next week or Alabama AM next week or Tuskegee next week. But University of Alabama, shit. You know about them. The point is, Malcolm says, so what they do, they crucify, they want to crucify Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders, why? Because he is turning inward. And he is not a, is not afraid to call you what you are. And if you're a human being, you shouldn't be afraid either. But what you're worried about is your raggedy ass doesn't meet the fire code house. The fire code would be the code of humanity. Your house built out of white nationalism. So he says uh, he makes the mistake of charging the one who awakened him with having set the fire. That's what they do. Anytime you the truth teller, they accuse you of setting the fire instead of they looking at the inferior materials their house is built out of. He says, Malcolm says, I hope that this little conversation tonight about the black revolution won't cause many of you to accuse us of igniting it when you find it at your doorstep. Malcolm goes on and says, during recent years, there's been much talk about the population explosion. Is this 2022? Is this the manifesto? Malcolm said, during recent years, there's been much talk about a population explosion. What, whenever they are speaking of the population explosion, in my opinion, they are referring primarily to the people in Asia or in Africa. Tuck, 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 Carlson. Malcolm says, in the black, brown, red, and yellow people, it is seen, Malcolm says, by people of the West that, comma, as soon as the standard of living is raised in Africa and Asia, automatically the people begin to reproduce abundantly. And there's been a great deal of fear engendered by this in the minds of the people of the West who happen to be on this earth, a very small minority. Tuck, 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 look, tuck. Ain't that your friend, Steve Bannon? Ain't that your friend, Stephen Miller? See, Bannon, Miller, Carlson, they don't, they ain't talking about the United States. That's their local point of departure, but they always put it in an international context of white nationalism. Malcolm telling you in 1964, when they started talking population explosion, they talking about y'all and they were always a minority to begin with. So what they're really talking about is reinforcing minority rule. And guess what, fellas? Minority rules come into America except it ain't minorities. Tony Morrison told Claudia Tate in that interview we talked about Monday night, I do not use the word minority, especially when I'm talking about my people. Stop using the word minority. It's a social structure framework. Once you say the word minority, you have now invited the social structure to define whatever comes next. We don't need no water. Let the motherfucker burn. Goes on and says, in fact, Malcolm says, in most of the thinking and planning of whites in the West today, it's easy to see the fear in their minds, conscious minds and subconscious minds, subconscious, Joe, extreme MAGA, ultra MAGA, Joe, subconscious minds, that the masses of dark people in the East who already outnumber them will continue to increase and multiply and grow until they eventually overrun the people of the West like a human sea, a human tide, a human flood. It sounds like the damn manifesto, except what Malcolm is saying is that ain't what we're doing, but that's what you think we're doing. That's your fear. Woman and a man have sex, male and a female rather, have sex, baby come out. <laughs> I must admit, Cat Williams. I don't know if you saw Cat Williams' new special. My man cracked me up. World War III? Yeah. World War III. Did you see it? Yes. So those of you who hadn't seen it, Cat Williams said the two most powerful things in the universe are water and the P word between black women's, uh, between women's legs. And when you say, Dr. Ben used to always, he cracked me up. Dr. Ben had a lecture he always gave called The Black Woman is God. And he would say then heaven is between a black woman's legs. And he was, uh, Ben Yakinen could have been a stand-up comedian. I'm just telling y'all right now. And so, but his whole point, and Cat Williams made his point, he said, you know, you have sex with a woman and then she make a copy of you. You can't do that as a male. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, so even the point, but Malcolm here is talking about, you know, when you're a human, human humans, two humans create another human. 
Why are you worried about the color of that human skin? Because you have so invested that skin color with this meaning that two things have happened. Now, mind you, this is from a cat, Malcolm X, who knew it from the inside. And like Deion Sanders dared Nick Saban, you want me to talk about it? You think Malcolm couldn't talk about the relationship between white women and black men and black women and white men? You think he didn't? Yeah, I know them speeches. Oh, go back and get that early, Malcolm. After he gets out of prison, he's in New York. Get that 59, Malcolm. That 58, Malcolm. Oh, my God. Oh, y'all get to hear them recordings from Malcolm. Is Woo, man. Woo. Malcolm said, I remember one speech Malcolm gave in Harlem. And y'all can find the recording. Some of y'all heard it. He said, now they in the press, the white press, saying that Malcolm X is in Harlem living with a white woman. And you hear some lady in the, in the crowd. Oh, no. <laughs> Malcolm said, Tell him if I'm living in Harlem with a white woman, it's his mother. And since it's his mother, I know how nasty she is. I mean, this is Malcolm early. Well, you know, Malcolm had to get that discipline. Woo! I'm convinced that some of the attraction to Malcolm X is because some of y'all like that kind of hardcore. But Malcolm had it. But the fire is no less present here. But he's tempered it a little bit. But my point is that this fascination with blackness is a byproduct too of white nationalism and white supremacy. And so the fear is also rooted in, watch it now, this is Toni Morrison and a mercy. This is uh, Tony K. Bombard. That fear is rooted also in mm, desire. Malcolm goes on and says, it governs the fear that is, it governs their political views and it governs their economic views and it governs most of their attitudes toward the present society. Malcolm says, I was listening to Dirksen. That's Everett Dirksen, who was an Illinois senator. The senator from Illinois in Washington, D.C., filibustering the civil rights bill. Shout out to Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema. He says, and one thing he kept stressing over and over was that if the bill is passed, this is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He says, if the bill is passed, it will change the social structure of America. Malcolm goes on and says, well, I know what he's getting at. And I think most other people today, and especially our people, know what is meant when these whites who filibuster these bills express fears of changes in the social structure. Our people are beginning to realize what they mean. Malcolm goes on and says, just as we can see that all over the world, one of the main problems facing the West is race. Likewise, here in America today, most of your Negro leaders, as well as the whites, agree that 1964 itself appears to be one of the most explosive years yet in the history of America on the racial front, on the racial sense, racial scene rather. Malcolm says, not only is this racial explosion probably to take place in America, but all the ingredients for this racial explosion in America to blossom into a worldwide racial explosion present themselves right here in front of us. America's racial powder keg in short can actually fuse or ignite a worldwide powder keg. Malcolm says, there are whites in this country who are still complacent when they see the possibilities of racial strife getting out of hand. All right, that's every commentator wringing their hands about this Buffalo thing and not going to do nothing to change it. He says, you are complacent simply because you think you outnumber the racial minority in this country. What you have to bear in mind is wherein you might outnumber us in this country. You don't outnumber us all over the earth. Oh, the world house that the king is talking about. Malcolm goes on and says, any kind of racial explosion that takes place in this country today in 1964 is not a racial explosion that can be confined to the shores of America. All the young people, all the old people, all the people watching money spent to Ukraine and you got poor people here and all over the world who could use that money. That's because Ukraine is a white country. That's not true. Sure it is. Mark Esper running around saying Trump was crazy and I was in the room, but I was there to kind of check on him. Uh-huh. But you want to overthrow the government of Venezuela. You're a white nationalist, Mark. And you're a hard white nationalist. You punk. I wouldn't spend a penny on your book. And when I do find it somewhere for a penny, I might pay a penny for it. But I'm going to hold my nose for the 20 minutes it takes me to leaf through it and see if there's anything in here I need to excise because every second of my life I spend reading this is a concession to your white nationalist lie that you now run around trying to make a million dollars writing about. Anyway, continuing. Malcolm says, it is a racial explosion that could ignite the racial powder keg that exists all over the planet we call Earth. I think that nobody would disagree that the dark masses of African, Asia, and Latin America are already seething with bitterness, animosity, hostility, unrest, and impatience with the racial intolerance that they themselves have experienced at the hands of the white West. 
And just as they have the ingredients of hostility toward the West in general, here we also have 22 million at the time, African-Americans who are black, brown, red, and yellow people in this country who are also seething with bitterness and impatience and hostility and animosity at the racial intolerance, not only of the white West, but of white America in particular. So what he basically says is that you think that the worldwide conflagration wouldn't be set off two years ago next week. George Floyd was killed. The world out in the street. People in this country out in the street. Convergence of COVID. They call it a racial reckoning. The company start paying a Negro consultants who made a lot of money two summers ago. Sold a lot of books that were never picked up two summers ago. Made a lot of TV appearances. Uh, they have found their way into scripts, whether it be Law and Order or Special Victims Unit, whatever. Yeah, they made a lot of money. They had a little tiny slice. But two, two summers ago, summer four last, these people were terrified that the revolution was on. Is this the time? Yeah, go back and read Thomas Jefferson. They've been tired. They've been scared of that since Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson called having the wolf by the ears. He worried about it. Is this is is this is, is this the rebellion? Yeah, we coming to slit your throat, Monticello. Go back to sleep, bro. Ding, ding, ding. <gasps> yeah, because you know, white fear not old. White fear is old as whiteness itself, because whiteness knows it's wrong. The roof is on fire. We don't need no water. Come on, man. Let them fucking burn. Because you think that somehow this roof burning, this house burning, going to consume you too. And no, it doesn't have to. Not unless you just throw yourself in there and decide you want to die too. But you'll die alone. If you're together, you don't die. Because then, And then when the thing is burnt, you build something else. Because you have to understand that as a metaphor. Now, we had a little fun with Rockmaster Scott and the Dynamic 3, but the simple fact of the matter is if you've been to the party and the DJ said the roof is on fire, we don't need no water. In other words, the roof can't hurt us. Get beyond the concept that you and that house are made of the same materials. If if this is, in other words, this ain't the fire that burns everything. This is not James Baldwin trying to plead with the social structure using a biblical allegory and saying the fire next time. God gave Moses the rainbow. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time. Yeah, except Baldwin, I'm sorry, brother. I agree with my brother, Daniel Black, who was saying this last week, went to a book signing, his latest book uh, that he has done, um, Don't Cry For Me. And somebody asked him a question about Baldwin, young brother, graduate student, asked him about Baldwin and what he thought about Baldwin. He said, you know, Baldwin was brilliant. Baldwin was very incisive, but Baldwin had a deep structural flaw in his thinking because he couldn't imagine himself in the image of God. And that made me think about John Henry Clark. John Henry Clark said, until you see African people pray to an African God in public, we always going to be enslaved. Why? Because if you think if you don't think God looked like you, then what are you saying about yourself and them people who you think look like God? The ball one is trapped. So you talk about the fire next time. OK, now what fire is in the ball one? Love Malcolm, love Mega Evers, love Martin Luther King. And this isn't a critique of James Baldwin because James Baldwin is representative. You know, one reason I think people love Baldwin so much is because he gives them comfort in spending your life. Arguing with the social structure. You don't need no water. Anyway, Malcolm continues and he says, um, let me go on because he says, that revolution, he says, well, black people are a minority in this country. He said, no, nah, you understand that the ingredients for this conflagration exist globally and it doesn't matter that if black people are not as numerous in the United States, if it goes off here, that is the fuse. He said, I don't want a bomb without a fuse. This is the fuse. When George Floyd was killed, the world moved. And these corporations shoveled out money out the door. They're giving money to HBCUs. All these people right here talking about they raised all this money for HBCUs. No, you didn't. You need to give a percentage of that money to Breonna Taylor family, to George Floyd's family, and Amar Aubrey's family, and every victim of state violence. You need to break off a percentage of that. Because you ain't get that money because all of a sudden there was a change of heart. That was white fear. To quote Roland, Roland Martin's got a book coming out at the end of the year. White fear. White fear. This is in the tradition of people who understand. Malcolm saying this in 64. He goes on where, uh, I'm going to skip over now, but I want to get to this point. He says, so today when the black man starts reaching out, when the black woman starts reaching out for what America says are his rights, her rights, their rights, they feel that they were in their rights. I'm, I'm editing now in terms of the pronouns. Well, I'll just use Malcolm now because we see he says he it was a time of the moment, but we know it's all of us. 
when he becomes the victim of brutality by those who are depriving him of his rights to do whatever is necessary to protect himself. An example of this was taking place last night at the same time in Cleveland, where the police were putting water hoses on our people there and also throwing tear gas at them. And they met a hail of stones, hail of rocks, hail of bricks. Remember Trump trying to make hay, gassing, going over and holding the Bible upside down? Mark Esper! Hell away from me. A hall of bricks, a hail of bricks, rather. A couple of weeks ago in Jacksonville, Florida, a young teenage Negro was throwing Molotov cocktails. Well, Negroes didn't do this 10 years ago. But what you should learn from this is that they are waking up. If it was stones yesterday, Molotov cocktails today, it will be hand grenades tomorrow and whatever else is available the next day. The seriousness of this situation must be faced up to. You should not feel that I'm inciting someone to violence. I'm only warning of a powder keg situation. You can take it or leave it. Okay. You know how many black people probably went out and bought guns in the wake of what happened last Saturday? See, y'all gonna find out about that Second Amendment. I don't think you believe in it as much as you do, you white nationalists. Because the minute we all got the strap, as old folks you say, ain't no fun when the chicken got the gun. Anyway, when the rabbit, rather. Ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun. Sorry about that. Old, old Southern saying. And it says, but if you ignore it or ridicule it, well, death is already at your doorstep. But if you take the warning, perhaps you can still save yourself. He says there are 22 million African-Americans who are ready to fight for independence right here. When I say fight for independence right here, I don't mean any nonviolent fight or turn of the cheek fight. Those days are gone. Those days are over. Tony K. Bambara in that interview, we talked about it on Monday night with Janae. She said, they asked her, yeah, Clay asked her, what do you think about the movement in the 60s and 70s? She said, the 60s, we said it with our chest. We had the manifestos, the takeovers. He said, the 70s, she said, the 70s was a period where we grappled with the implications of what had happened in the 60s and we were institution building. She said, but now we're in, after the, after, now we entered the 80s and that's why you saw the pushback. This is the period of the R word, Reagan, who, what he represented, the first MAGA in terms of articulating make America great again. This is the clawback. And what Malcolm was, who was assassinated in February 1965, he did not live to see the Warren Court. So in other words, he didn't see those Supreme Court decisions. He didn't see Roe. He didn't see school desegregation in terms of actual implementation, Schwamberg, Charlotte, Mettlenburg. He didn't see any of those things because he's going to say something a little bit later in a minute, and I'm going to kind of begin to close this out, where he talks about the fact that you can't get liberation from this system, including the courts. But he doesn't live to see that just like two summers ago, those concessions were out of fear that it was finally the moment when this was enough. When you organize, it's not a one size fits all, one strategy and discard to others. This combined effort, and remember Malcolm says they throwing Molotovs, they weren't doing that before, but of course Malcolm knew Adam Clayton Powell and he knew about the Harlem Riot of 1943 and he lived through these periods. In fact, he understood that there have been moments when black people did fight and push back, including his own father and mother. So he's making a point here about this next generation and guess what? It ain't gonna be too many more busting up in people, slaughtering black people. As Thanos told Thor, in Avengers Infinity War. Shout out to the brother security guard who lost his life trying to take this guy out. Next time, go for the head. Anyway, we continue. He says, if George Washington didn't get independence for this country nonviolently, and if Patrick Henry didn't come up with a nonviolent statement, shout out to Sam Alito talking about our traditions, whoever R is. And if you taught me to look upon them as patriots and heroes, well, it's time for you to realize that I have studied your books well. In 1964, we'll see the Negro Revolt evolve and merge into the worldwide Black Revolution that has been taking place on this earth since 1945. The so-called revolt will become a real Black Revolution. Now, the Black Revolution has been taking place in Africa and Asia and Latin America. When I say Black, I mean non-white. Black, brown, red, or yellow. Our brothers and sisters are in Asia who were colonized by the Europeans. Our brothers and sisters in Amer Africa who were colonized by the Europeans. And in Latin America, the peasants who were colonized by the Europeans have been involved in a struggle since 1945 to get the colonials or the colonizing powers, the Europeans, off their land, out of their country. Pause there. Obviously, it didn't happen. But what is also obvious that it continued to be worked for. Tony K. Bombar writes about this work toward that traveled all over Cuba, Africa, Caribbean, everywhere, Europe thinking about how do we build connections among human beings who want to be liberated and live to a fuller life. This is the global context that must import, 
form all local struggle. Malcolm is talking about that. He says, this is a real revolution. He goes on and says, revolution is always based on land. Revolution is never based on begging somebody for an integrated cup of coffee. Revolutions are never fought by turning the other cheek. Revolutions are never based upon love your enemy and pray for those who slightly use you. And revolutions are never waged singing, we shall overcome. Revolutions are based upon bloodshed. Revolutions are never compromising. They are never based upon the negotiations. Revolutions are never based upon any kind of tokenism whatsoever. He goes on. My point is, this ain't 1962. This ain't 19 1952, this ain't 1960, 61. This is not Nation of Islam. This is 1964, April, less than a year before he's assassinated. Stop lying on Malcolm X. He went to Mecca and he found out about y'all better listen. I'm sorry, not y'all. Because I'm talking like I'm talking to the social structure. We're talking to each other right now. As Malcolm said, we just having a little chat between you and me. That was meshed to the grassroots. Anyway, let's continue. He says, there is no system more corrupt than a system that represents itself as the example of freedom, the example of democracy, and can go all over this earth telling other people how to straighten out their house when you have citizens of this country who have used have to use bullets if they want to cast a ballot. Pause. I'm going to read that one more time as we kind of wind this up. Malcolm says, there is no system more corrupt than a system that represents itself as the example of freedom, the example of democracy, and can go all over this earth, Ukraine, telling other people, Russia, how to straighten out their house when you have citizens of this country who have to use bullets if they want to cast a ballot. Two things very quickly. Number one, I was reading an article. Uh, there was a meeting last Friday, a week ago yesterday, at the UN of the International Conference of Writers. And this young brother from Cameroon that said, we are all aware that the people who are speaking most forcefully in support of Ukraine are, are in the countries that most forcefully oppressed African people and colonized the world. And he said that because the conversation came up, well, how come the African countries haven't come out and condemned Russia? Like Nelson Mandela said, don't assume that your enemies are my enemies. When he met with Yasser Arafat and Fidel Castro, don't assume your enemies are my enemies. What about, hey, 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 we talking to each other. Whatever differences we got, we'll work those out. And believe me, we got differences and we'll work them out. But what we not going to do is listen to you as, Mal as Muhammad Ali, who joined the Nation of Islam because of Malcolm X said, when he talked about Vietnam, you my opposer. In other words, why well, I got to go over there and fight somebody, this man, because you told me to fight them and I got to fight you right here. Malcolm goes on. He says, the greatest weapon the colonial powers have used in the past against our people has always been divide and conquer. America is a colonial power. She has colonized 22 million Afro-Americans by depriving us of first-class citizenship, by depriving us of civil rights, actually by depriving us of human rights. This is careful now. This is everybody says, well, why are we voting? You like Malcolm? Listen to Malcolm. Malcolm says, she has not only deprived us of the right to be a citizen, she has deprived us of the right to be human beings. You see, he makes a distinction between citizenship and humanity. Two different things. The right to be recognized and respected as men and women. In this country, the black can be 50 years old and still a boy. Now watch this. He says, I grew up with white people. This is what Malcolm is saying to this overwhelmingly white audience. He said, I grew up with white people. I was integrated before they even invented the word. And I've never met white people yet. If you're around them long enough, who won't refer to you as a boy or a gal, no matter how old you are or what school you came out of, no matter what your intellectual or professional level is. In this society, we remain boys. Nick Saban on Dion. Hey, but you picked the right one, baby. He says, so American strategy is the same strategy as that which was used in the past by the colonial powers, divide and conquer. She plays one Negro leader against the other. She plays one Negro organization against the other. She makes us think that we have different objectives, different goals. As soon as one Negro says something, she runs to this Negro and asks him, what do you think about what he said? Why, anybody can see through that, that today, except some of the Negro leaders. The maps were released today, uh, this week. Special master in the courts after the White Nationalist Party sued in the state of New York. There are 26 congressional districts in the state of New York. There are five districts now where incumbents will be running against each other. Potentially. Hakeem Jeffries and uh, Yvette Clark are in one. I think the Central District of Brooklyn, the ninth district. But one of them could move to the eighth district, which is next door, and run uh, and, and still get that seat. So they're going to have to decide. But here's the thing. The white boy, Sean Mahoney, who's over the DCCC, the one that can recruit candidates, he wants to run in a district he don't even live in. And you got Jamal Bowman and Mondaire Jones, two members of the Congressional Black Caucus, who are also part of the Progressive Caucus, who they trying to now perhaps run against each other. 
And they saying to Jones and Bowman, y'all don't run against each other. When y'all run against that white boy, because he going to come and invade the district and push y'all to run against each other in the other district. I agree. Take that white boy out. Why? Malcolm then told y'all that, see, the fight in the in the Democratic Party, which many soft white nationalists the Democratic Party, is to minimize those people who see that politics is a question of using tools to gather resources and the D or the R don't mean nothing for us. We trying to get resources. People talk, Corey Bush, you ain't getting nothing done. Corey Bush just delivered millions to St. Louis. Millions in federal aid over and above anything else. Now, the place is locked up. You got Joe Manchin, got instructions. You got Kristen Sinema giving instructions. So is the solution not to vote? Let's see what Malcolm, no, you got to overvote now. You got to go out here and vote. Oh, Malcolm would never say that. Okay, I'm going to end with this. Our people have made the mistake of confusing the methods with the objectives, Malcolm says. As long as we agree on objectives, we should never fall out with each other just because we believe in different methods or tactics or strategies to reach a common objective. He says we have to keep in mind at all times, we are not fighting for integration, nor are we fighting for separation. We are fighting for recognition as human beings. In the question and answer, they asked him about integration. He said, uh-uh, y'all ain't gonna get me in that trick bag. I don't even accept the premise. He goes on, we are fighting for the right to live as free humans in this society. In fact, we are actually fighting for rights that are even greater than civil rights, and that is human rights. And then he, when he's talking, let me talk specifically about voting. I'm going to go on for a second here. He says, um, you have whites in the, in the community who express sincerity when they say they want to help. Well, how can they help? How can a white person help the black man solve his problem? Number one, you can't solve it for him. You can help him solve it, but you can't solve it for him today. One of the best ways that you can help him solve it is to let the so-called Negro who has been involved in the civil rights struggle see that the civil rights struggle must be expanded beyond the level of civil rights to human rights. Once it is expanded beyond the level of civil rights to the level of human rights, it opens the door for all of our brothers and sisters in Africa and Asia who were, who have their independence to come to the rescue. He starts talking about taking the, you know, people to the to the uh, to the world court and the UN. Well, that still doesn't. Uh, that still doesn't deal with the question of voting. He says, if Negroes could vote south of the, and he says, yes, if Negroes could vote south of the Canadian border, because he said everything south of the Canadian border is the south, as far as Malcolm's concerned in the U.S. South, south, he says, if Negroes could vote in the southern part of the south, Ellender wouldn't be the head of Agricultural and Forestry Committee. Richard Russell wouldn't be head of the Armed Services Committee. Robertson of Virginia wouldn't be the head of the Banking and Currency Committee. Imagine that, Malcolm asked. All of the banking and currency of the government is in the hands of a cracker. That's what Malcolm says. He goes on and says, in fact, when you see how many of these committee men are from the South, incumbency, you can see that we have nothing but a cracker government in Washington, D.C., and their head is a cracker president. I said a cracker president. Texas is just as much cracker state as Mississippi. He says the first thing this man did when he came in office was invite all the big no big Negroes down for coffee. James Farmer was one of the first ones, the head of CORE. I have nothing against him. He's all right, Farmer, that is. But could that same president have invited James Farmer to Texas for coffee? And if James Farmer went to Texas, could he have taken his white wife with him to have coffee with the president? Anytime you have a man who can't straighten out Texas, how can he straighten out the country? No, you're barking up the wrong tree, Malcolm says. He says, if Negroes in the South could vote, the Dixiecrats would lose power. Pay very careful attention. I'm bringing this in for a landing. He says, if Negroes in the South could vote, the Dixiecrats would lose power. When the Dixiecrats lost power, the Democrats would lose power. Now, translate that to today. If black people in the South could vote and would vote and could vote and together organized to vote, Gary Chambers, we talked about him a, few, a month ago, the white nationalists would lose Mississippi, would lose Louisiana, would lose Georgia. Yeah, they, and they're setting up the steel 2024. What you going to do about it? He continues, Malcolm says, therefore, the two of them have to conspire with each other to stay in power. The Northern Dixiecrat puts all the blame on the Southern Dixiecrat. It's a con game, a giant political con game. The, the job of the Northern Democrat is to make the Negro think that he's our friend. He's, he's always smiling and wagging his tail and telling us how much he can do for us if we vote for him. But at the same time, that he's out in front telling us what he's going to do, Joe Biden, behind the doors, he's in cahoots with the Southern Democrats, setting up the machinery to make sure he never had to keep his promise. Now, this is what most people, that's all they pick out of Malcolm. See, the parties are the same. Ha <laughs> ha, your mouth, close it. Eyes, use them. <laughs> Very important to understand this. Joe Biden's a soft white nationalist. Otherwise, he wouldn't be talking about ultra MAGA. MAGA mean ultra Joe. Oh, I see you trying to save your house, but the roof is on fire. 
Bondia Jones, Corey Bush. We don't need no water. But you're a Democrat. I ran in the party that would get me into the Congress. And I say what I need to say to stay in the Congress. But did you get some money to help with affordable housing in St. Louis? Yeah, because you paid taxes, right? Yeah. So until we have this revolution, this is a process. And don't assume that we can't do that. Don't lump me with Joe Manchin because we both got a D. Do you ever, do you even listen? Do you even listen, sis? Do you even listen, bro? To my speeches on the floor, do you look at my vote? Because if you did, you'd understand who our real enemies are. And them D's and R's don't mean a damn thing to us. But you read what Malcolm said. No, I'm just going to pull this out. See, the Disney crap, they're the same. Ah. Malcolm is telling you how to do this. He said, this is a conspiracy that our people have faced in this country the past hundred years. And today you have a new generation of black people who have come on the scene, who have become disenchanted with the entire system, who have become disillusioned over the system and who are ready now and willing to do something about it. Tony K. Mabar says, in the 70s, we continue to build out of the momentum of the 60s. But then the 80s come, the white lash organizes. And what a job of a culture keeper, a memory keeper is not just to describe the world as it is, but to ground themselves as you mentioned, like what Tupac is beginning, was done, was trying to do, beginning to do before his life was cut short, and use that to project forward a vision. That becomes the political possibility. Now, we live in a society where what you know is not important in politics. Now, of the two parties, Democrat and the White Nationalist Party, the White Nationalist Party is the one that elects celebrities, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Donald Trump. You name, they're the Sonny Bono. I mean, you, you what the hell? What, yeah, because we understand. What about Al Franken? What about Al Franken? Al Franken was smart, too. Donald Trump has is is got some type of mental disease. And y'all made him the president of the whole damn United States. What about Joe Biden? Joe Biden is 138,000 years old. And if you go back and look at Joe Biden 30 years ago, when he, unfortunately, as a soft white nationalist, helped put as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, he misspoke more in 89 and 90 and 91 than he does in 2022. But that would require actually studying. And if you're just going to spend the whole of your life looking at whatever image flies across your eyes in the middle of a content fury that is all driven by a profit motive, then you get what you want and you will burn up in that house because you are beginning to be made of the same thing that house is made of. All right, we continue. He says, so in my conclusion, in speaking about the black revolution, America today is at a time or in a day or at an hour. This is 1964. Where she is the first country on this earth that can actually have a bloodless revolution. See, people put the blood revolution on Malcolm, but you got to read the whole thing Malcolm is saying. He says, in the past, revolutions have been bloody. Historically, you just don't have a peaceful revolution. Revolutions are bloody, revolutions are violent, revolutions cause bloodshed, and death follows in their past. We heard that earlier. Malcolm goes on and says, America is the only country in history in a position to bring about a revolution without violence and bloodshed. Here's the money sentence, Malcolm says, but America is not morally equipped to do so. Why is this is Dr. King? Come on, y'all. This is James Cone, Malcolm and Martin in America. When you read, he's, he's looking at both of them. He said, look at that. That's why you got to kill those cats because they want the same thing. Now, Malcolm didn't want one with my brain. <laughs> Of the two of them, which one went to school with more white people as a child? Malcolm or Martin? Don't get mad, get smart. Malcolm says, why is America in a position to bring about a bloodless revolution? Because the Negro in this country holds the balance of power. Y'all better listen to Malcolm or Gary Chambers as he talked to Karen Hunter about the numbers in Louisiana. Malcolm says the Negro holds the balance of power, he says, and if the Negro in this country were given what the Constitution says he's supposed to have, the added power of the Negro in this country would sweep all of the racists and segregationists out of office. I don't vote. Malcolm wouldn't vote. <laughs> Silence. Lips. Eyes. Page. Continue. It would change the entire political structure of the country. It will wipe out the Southern segregationism that now controls American foreign policy as well as America's domestic policy. There's the link to our brothers and sisters around the world. It would change the demand. You got to get different people in there. Now, while we talk about, I ain't voting, and people ain't never do the money. You know what they doing? Busting their ass to make sure you can't. Busting their ass to make sure that even if you get the numbers, they got the secretaries of state who are also in the ballot this week to 
overturn the elections. What Malcolm is saying is, go ahead. Because if you do that, then we just set it on fire. And then we don't need no water. And you can't put it out either, Malcolm says. And the only way without bloodshed that this can be brought about is that the black man has to be given full use of the ballot in every one of the 50 states. I'm going to read that again. So people don't, in fact, I even underline it. Y'all don't believe Malcolm X said that. He said, and the only way without bloodshed, without only way without bloodshed, that this can be brought about is that the black man has to be given full use of the ballot in every one of the 50 states. But if the black man doesn't get the ballot, then you are going to be faced with another man who forgets the ballot and starts using the bullet. And he says, he's got two more paragraphs, so I'll just read it straight. He says, revolutions are fought to get control of land, to remove the absentee landlord and to gain control of the land and the institutions that flow from that land. The black man has been in a very low condition because he has had no control whatsoever over any land. He has been a beggar economically, a beggar politically, a beggar socially, a beggar even when it comes to trying to get some education. The past type of mentality that was developed in this colonial system among our people today is being overcome. And as the young ones come up, they know what they want. And as they listen to your beautiful preaching about democracy and all those other flowery words, they know what they're supposed to have. This is where the baton has to be picked up and passed again so that we know what we want, have, need. Last paragraph, he says, so you have a people today who are not on, who not only know what they want, but also know what they were supposed to have. And they themselves are creating another generation that is coming up that not only will know what it wants and know what it should have, but will also be ready and willing to do whatever is necessary to see that what they should have materializes immediately. Thank you. Now, it's pretty clear when you say prior. Two days after Malcolm's birthday has become the anniversary of George Floyd, that if we were to study, we will understand that we're going to stop this cosplay and make up a Malcolm X, make up a Martin Luther King and make them fight each other. When in fact, <laughs> it's a very different. Con the solutions are there. But, you know, meanwhile, the roof is on fire, but we don't need no water. <laughs> we we can think about this differently. Anyway, I'm a bubble. That, that that part you said about Meshach, Shadrach, and I call yes. him and a Billy Goat. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah. we're we're Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That's we, right. I didn't know that that's who we were until you said it. We and don't no, need no we, water. Yes, you did. No fire can't touch us. You can't touch us. Because remember, they put them boys in there and they opened it up and said, I put three in and I seen fourth. And the fourth was God, the son of God. Right. That's Kefaneptus in there. That's Paul Robeson. That's Malcolm and Betty in there. That's that's George Floyd in there now. That's that, that's Breonna Taylor in there. You can't kill us. We don't need no water. <laughs> but we got to know that. See, that's the trick. It ain't enough. We in that like you know, with all due respect to our ancestor Robin Harris. We baby kids, we don't die, we multiply. But if you multiply as individuals. You might mess around and get burned up. Okay. I thank you. Uh so many things, you know, fire is inspirational. I'm thinking about uh Richard Pryor when he set himself on fire, you know, and we know that fire is purifying, and we know that out of fire, you know, when the volcanoes erupt, that's when the soil is the richest to build and the, and the plant things that grow out of out of ash. That's right. So yeah, we don't need any water. Thank you. Need water. In fact, in fact, I'm glad you said that because uh that fire reduces thing to its essential element, to the carbon. That's right. And so what we're trying to preserve, no, let it go. Let it go. Why in fact ask yourself why are you trying to preserve it in the first place? Because you think it's the only place you have. That's and that was this is what Malcolm was saying. They got you looking in the wrong direction. But I'll do respect. Let's purge it. And guess what? You ain't got a set of fire. It's already on. The roof is on fire. <laughs> we got Negroes from talking about. We need to. No, no, no. Had, had me thinking, well, how, how, are we firefighters? You know, should we get firefighter training? You know, because you said get out the house, like, and preserve all of the things that you that are valuable. That's what you do when the house is on fire. You take all of the valuable things out, and then you know, hopefully they can put them. But but then I was like, should we be firefighters? No. no. Thank you. No. Thank you. No. 
No. In fact, I'm so glad you said it because you're right. When we're in the back and forth, when you put that question out, when something is on fire, you get out of it. You get the human beings out. And if you got some precious things you want to take out of there, okay. But guess what? If it's on fire like that, and see, every time something we built is on fire, they don't send the fire department until it's burnt. So you're going to learn. You're going to learn. They won't even, look, last January, they tore up, the, uh, these white nationalists came and tore up their own capital. Here we are, a year and a half later, they still have a hearings. Y'all keep messing with out of these people. They, show up. they show, showed up for the threat of the Supreme Court put barricades up. They were, you know, going to make sure they preserve that law. No Ooh. question. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll be back here again in a few weeks when the decision comes out. Now that they workshopped it, seen what the potential, you know, and yeah, people say, oh, that leak wasn't a mistake. Yeah, okay, of course it wasn't a mistake. Yeah, and out outrage. Who leaked it? You did. You leaked, you leaked it. it. <laughs> right. I mean, and that's not even conspiracy. Who had it? You. And now who has it? Y'all. Okay, so you leaked it. We didn't know it was there and now it's everywhere, which means the by lot the only way we're not talking about who which individual, we're not talking about which computer, it was there and now it's here, which means you leaked it. I mean, it don't even <laughs> y'all don't argue with these people. And, and let's not get caught up by smoke inhalation because that, that? that kills more people than the actual fire itself. And I feel like you know, if us are, you know, breathing in all of the disinformation, the misinformation, all of the tools that are keeping the fire going, all of the gasoline that is being thrown on fire, we're inhaling the smoke from teach, it. Teach. You better we're use out. that metaphor. You better work that metaphor out. This metaphor. Blow yeah. it out. Blow it out. Let's not. Second smoke, yo. And uh, smoke I, is right. I got to sit in this for a minute. You know, you know, mess me up and I'm going to go back. And the, the book that you were reading from, because I, I want to read the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. This, uh, his speech, is in Malcolm X Speaks, which is Selected Speeches and Statements, Pathfinder Press. You all can get that one. That's actually a very good compendium. No, no, no. I'm going to say less because Manny Marable uh, edited one before. Now, if you want the question and answer session that follows where these white people start asking him questions, he starts getting into integration. He starts getting into, um, in fact, militancy. He says, for example, I'll just give you a quick one. He says, on the other hand, if we can get an all-black school, that we control, staff it ourselves with the type of teachers that have our good at heart, with the type of books that have in them many of the missing ingredients that have produced this inferiority complex in our people, then we don't feel that an all-black school is necessarily a segregated school. It's only segregated when it's controlled by someone from outside. I hope I'm making my point. I just can't see where if white people can go to a white classroom and there are no Negroes present and it doesn't affect the academic diet they're receiving, then I don't see where an all-black classroom can be affected by the absence of white children. If the absence of black children doesn't affect white students, I don't see how the absence of whites is going to affect the blacks. So what the integrationists, in my opinion, are saying is they say when whites and blacks must go to school together is that whites are so much superior that just their presence in a black classroom balances it out. I can't go along with that. Uh, yes, ma'am. And then he goes to the next question. Anyway, that's in by any means necessary. <laughs> I mean. One of the reasons we love Malcolm is because Malcolm used to say, I say the thing you think it, but you won't say it. But now we have Nubian. Yeah, have I, don't, I don't think, I think he, I wasn't thinking these things. So I'm grateful. Oh. I'm grateful for the thoughts that whatever ran through that man to, to utter it. I, I need to sit with this. Yeah, um, yeah, Malcolm, Malcolm is, well, you know, I, I think, but you would not, I'm sure you wouldn't have said as a little girl or today. That, your, that there was a white businessman that was better than your daddy. No, but you know, to, to have the words. Right, you know, that's true. When our soul is there, all of the material, everything is there. That's true. We just, we need the water for that. We need yeah. that water to, to, to let that grow in our spirits. But you know, when you hear a thing, you're like, oh, I absolutely feel that way. But absolutely. I didn't have the words and I didn't even have the concept. You know, and and I, I I'm I'm trying to give grace to people who aren't there yet, which of is course, the hardest course. thing in the world for me is to like, why the hell isn't everyone? <laughs> well, we're, we're teachers, and that's part of it. It's got we got to have that space because we're all in that space. Yeah, we're so, all in that space. When I was a little boy, I wanted to be president of the United States. <laughs> I want to be president. Of, I was a little boy, kindergarten, first grade. 
Now, if I could be president of the United States, I don't know, maybe I would be. <laughs> Say less. Say yeah. Less. No, I mean, I would be. No, but then, you know, it'd be a different United States. Because, oh. uh, you know, now, meanwhile, oh. we got we got stuck with the bill for a black president, but we didn't have a black president to get stuck with the bill for. We got a, a, a roof is on fire president and he put out the fire. Bailed out the banks. <laughs> Didn't codify Roe versus Wade. And when asked about it, said, I want to get to something where we all agree on. Oh, OK. So, all right. But when Negroes came for him, he danced, had Stevie Wonder at the White House. You know, they, <laughs> no, bro. <laughs> I'll, I'll see Nubians tomorrow because uh, it's gonna be more of the same. Because Doctor Senyata Amin is cut from this. Y'all got the y'all got the same mind. Oh man, she uh, Janessa last week. She she brought up uh, Yimmy Ya. She was bringing up. Uh, she breaking down what she did at Healthy Wealthy Wise in oh. a series. So we're doing set. She did part one with Allegra. Uh Tomorrow we're gonna, we're gonna take all of the days of the week. She's gonna just break them all out and feed us. Like the mama bird that she is into yeah. our souls. I appreciate that. And then Monday office hours, you are we're doing Blake. This is this yeah. is the second edition, but it, but it's already here. Blake or the Huts of America. We are doing the first part, part one. Martin Robeson Delaney. We're doing part one, which is the first 34 chapters, but the chapters are very small. We're gonna have an incredible conversation about Blake or the Huts of America. It doesn't matter which edition you get if you want to buy it. Uh, now and then, of course, we do that next uh, this Monday, part one, a week from Monday, part two, and then Ooh. OEB. There she is. There she is, Octavia Butler. Ah. But I had to resist the urge. You know, I stopped by the bookstores. I had to go and go to the bookstores. So I resisted the urge. I saw the gra there are graphic uh, novels for each of those, but you don't want the graphic novels except to complete your collection. In fact, I have them. I have that. Was they are right there. Parable of the Sower, right there. That's right. But 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 you know we want to read the language. Oh. So and and we can actually compare. You know we get we we got one of the finest thinkers and who works in that area too in terms of Uraeus. Maybe we can integrate some of the conversation in the parable, uh, in the graphic novel, and see how it's portrayed in that space. And fortunately, nobody has taken the film rights and messed up a movie yet. So uh, let's well, just let her teach us. Marie, Marie and Tanana Ribdu and I had a conversation. Uh, oh, Octavia tried to tell them it's in narrative. So anybody that's in narrative, you can go. Yes. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll put that out uh, so that you can uh, sit with that. So we yeah. are the beginning conversation about yeah. this before we knew that this was, this is before we had a Nubia, I think. So. Wow. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. So do is the, is, is, Cutting edge, she and her husband. Well, she on her own. Yeah. yeah, no, she's on her own. I didn't even know about Stephen Barnes. I I got caught up in the Living Blood, which yeah. she's about. Uh, it's not really vampires because it doesn't feel like a vampire when she's writing about it. But she 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 had a phrase about Michael Jackson and that voice in there, and I was like, I said the language of this woman. I didn't know of an Octavia Butler. I learned about Tanana Ribdu first, and then I read, read The Good House, uh, My yeah. Soul to Keep, and all, and then I've just been on Joplin's Ghost. Joplin's Ghost. Did a um a fictionalized version of I think uh, Madam C.J. Walker. Yeah. She, like, uh, she to me was the person that introduced me to Afrofuturism, and then she introduced me to Octavia Butler. So I couldn't have a conversation about this woman without talking with her. But incredible writer. Incredible, incredible, yeah. incredible writer. I love it. All right, love you. you. Gotta go. I love you. See you, Nubians in the Nubian streets, uh, and you know we'll talk. We we'll talk. Love.